Well, this that's hey. very interesting. I, I seem to have hit a button twice, and now my intro is playing twice as we're talking. Awesome. Awesome. And that is the beauty it of doing is. these live. Yeah, man. It's almost that's over. I can just hear the about. audio of one. I wish that would stop. You it's never know what's going to happen. <laughs> but that's why we do these live. Because normally right now, this would go, and I would do my whole spiel of, hello, folks, and welcome. But that totally... Hey, what's going on here? I've got something playing in the background. I know what it is. It's me. I have. Bam. Okay. Tip to people who, who do this kind of thing. Do not have your web browser open in the background because it will play back at you. Five seconds oh, yeah. behind. Yeah. And that's not real cool. Oh, no. <laughs> Folks, you came here for the train wreck. You just saw it. You just saw it. <laughs> but luckily for me, I'm talking to Ken Haas. Ken, welcome. Thank you. Oh, shit. There's an audience. I like on it. My, on my little controller, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I played that, I played that little um, applause to – it was Scott Henderson. And he laughed and he said – I heard a woman in that clapping and say and cheering. Women don't come to my gigs. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, he's. I've never heard that before. Yeah. Oh, classic. classic. No, he might have heard my wife Penny cheering for him. We sponsored a show that he was on. Uh, boy, it's been ten years. Jeez. Um, and what a player. You know, there's there. I we're just going to start right off the bat with talking about other people instead of uh, either of us or what we do. But, um, you know, there's a handful of people that I've seen over the years that are that that you just and I have seen a lot of gigs and a lot of guitar players and I've been doing this shit for a long time, you know, and uh, and you think like, oh, I'm 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 too cool for all this or and I don't really think that. But I, people get that idea in their head and I've gotten the idea in my head, especially at an event like a NAM show or, or, at, or at a at a big public guitar show or something. Where you're like, yeah, yeah, I've heard a million guitar players today. I really don't give a shit. I just want to like go have a quiet beer somewhere and get some rest. And we were sponsoring this show that Scott Henderson was Henderson was on, and I mean, just I I didn't know I you know you hear I heard he was good. You you hear people are good all the time. People, are, oh, you got to see this guy; he's great, you know. But really, I I was floored, and I, I've had that experience. I mean, enough times in this business that I, I should be more prepared for it than I am when it happens. You know, Tommy Emanuel, I'm not an acoustic guitar guy, you know, and I, I, I always I, I have a lot of respect for anybody that can play anything. You know, it's just we're not we don't exist in the acoustic guitar world. And he was on a show that, that we were a part of, too. And just like I got like total tunnel vision. I'd never seen anything like it or knew that anything like it was possible. And, and it was, it's one of those things that you have to experience live. I could look up Scott Henderson videos or Tommy Emmanuel videos on the web for a day and never get come close to that experience of sitting in front of those guys. So there, there's that. <laughs> I'm just pasting that link that I said I was going to do before, which I totally do that to do. But uh, while I do that, um, I'm going to try well, and at the same time. Uh, this is the beauty yeah. of doing it live. Um, yeah. I had a photo shoot with Tommy Emmanuel when I was quite young. Um, and he, yeah, yeah, that's right. He's a down under fella. He is. And he handed me his guitar. I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to close all that there. Um, handed me his guitar and said, Hey, have a play. And I just looked at the guy and said, no, thank you. <laughs> what are you going to play in front of Tommy Emmanuel? Yeah, no, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I it was, mm. but some people just have that magic uh, and they do. And there's, there's, there's players out there that I, I, you know, there, there's that top, there's that top tier sort of player guy that, that, um, you know, they hit one note and you know who they are and they could hit that note on anything. Uh, I, I have an interesting story. One of these like NAM events was back, you know, backstage at one of these NAM events, a bunch of people, and this isn't my story. I wish I would have been there. Um, but we, we used to work with this 
producer gentleman who who shared this story with us amongst a bunch of very fascinating print stories too but um he was backstage with eddie van halen at at what might have been a early evh event or maybe it was even a pb event and a bunch of people were passing around uh like hundred dollar um uh daisy rock acoustic in the backstage room and he, somebody handed it to him and he started playing on it and and this guy was like he sounded just like him like it was just completely amazing like he it it he's playing this hundred dollar acoustic guitar and it really sounds like he's plugged you know into a wall of marshalls in 1977 because it's in his hands and and you can you can chase that stuff all you want to your whole life you know but you're only going to get so close to it um and and i've i've got a, a bunch of stories like that but there's just a handful of guys that really have that touch you know i i've had the pleasure of showing guitars to mark knopfler a few times and he sat in front of me and just played unplugged you know and and songs that i've heard a million times and little he said played part of part of the guitar solo to sultan's a swing in front of me just unplugged wow. on one of my guitars and it was <laughs> i'm just sitting there like goosebumps like yeah. Wow, man, Mark Knopfler is seriously my first big guitar hero uh, when I was awesome. 12 years old or something. Uh, yeah, I, I have a similar story. I, it's you, you had told me because you see, you, you don't prepare any of your questions. That's right. The only thing that you, you the only thing that you, you got my said whiteboard was, was, yeah, right. I am going to uh, just ask you what what started your electric guitar bug so hard, and um. And yeah, Monopoly figures into that story for me. Um, so when I was a kid, when I was a wee lad uh, in the 70s, um, I, I'm 52 now, so I was born in 69. And in the 70s, I had an uncle, uh, Mike Collins was his name, who's a guitar player in the Detroit area. And uh, he was like, he was like my cool musician uncle, you know, he, um, he toured America with, uh, as a guitar player in the touring version of Herman's Hermits. I think it was one of the things that he did. And he, um, he just, he did a lot of, a lot of gigs around the Detroit area and did a few tours and did some stuff. And then by the, by the mid seventies, his career had sort of wound down and he had some substance abuse problems and blah, 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 blah. Long story short, um, he committed suicide in 19, early 1980. And I was 11. And, um, and then he had, he had sold off almost all of his gear, but he had a, a 60, um, 68 telly and this 65 twin that you see over my shoulder here underneath of that roll ahead. And that, that is a real 65 twin with, uh, EVs from the factory and that belonged to my uncle. And those two things were in his room. And my grandparents did that thing where they didn't touch anything for a long time. Yeah. I know it yeah. seems really personal, but I've told this story before. And uh, so I used to go into his room as like a 12 year old boy and pull, pull the telly out from under the bed and open the case and just sit and stare at it. And then I, and I, didn't, I didn't take it out of the case for like a long time. And then eventually I would take it out of the case and hold it in my lap. And then eventually I would pluck the strings. And, um, and he had an acoustic too and uh i took that my that was given to me and i took a few lessons on it and it the lessons on the acoustic didn't connect with me at 12 or 13 and because i wanted to play punk rock you know and um but every time i visited my grandparents i took that guitar out and one day when i was over there my grandfather caught me you know holding the guitar and he said it's about time you took those home and i was just completely floored that was my first guitar and my first amp. And of course, I still have them both. The amp we use here in the studio, uh, it, usually um, it is the amp that Greg uh, Coke plays through every time he comes in. And uh, and uh, so at, at any rate, that's what started me down that road. And so his brother is was my natural father. And um, he was a huge... Uh, Dire Straits and Pink Floyd fan. And I didn't spend a lot of time with him when I was growing up, but when I did, we listened to music. And when I was a teenager, 
um, I went and spent some time with him and he sort of, I don't know, man, he sort of walked me through some of these prog rock bands, you know, and, uh, and the Nathler thing just, just really struck a nerve and it, it always has. And, and there's, there's songs of his that, that just the, I mean, his whole career, his solo career is incredible. His solo records are amazing. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Knopfler, and they, I still play finger style quite a bit, you know, and I and I don't play it right because nobody ever taught me how to do it. And so I use three fingers, which is pretty much what he does. And so it's kind of fun, you know, to to um, incorporate that into some of the music that I play in bands. And uh, yeah, and and now, of course, I've got um, I've had the pleasure of meeting Mark a few times and which has been amazing to me. And uh, it, and that really started about 15 years ago i was working um when i was early days working for joe uh, i reached out to mark's keyboard player guy fletcher on a um on his tour blog and said hey i see you're coming to detroit you know uh i work for this guy joe naylor at reverend guitars and, and we'd like to show you stuff and the dude sent me a message like oh we'd love to have you man we i really i know about you guys and i'd really like Guy wanted to see this and that, and Richard Bennett wanted to see something, and Mark wanted to see something, and we were like, shit, loading up the car and going to see Knopfler when he was touring for Shangri-La, I believe it was. Wow. And then that opened up the door to me for Rudy's music in New York City, who uh, Rudy Pensa and Mark has the Pensa custom guitars, and I, I now have a couple of those Pensa guitars, too, in my collection. And, um, and I've had a nice back and forth with Mark and Guy. It's been a while now, but everything has been a while now because everything sucks. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, so there's, there's my Mark Knopfler story. He's got a flat rock and a descent baritone. And, um, I, I hear the flat rock gets used for slide stuff in his studio, uh, occasionally or whatever. Um, but yeah, really, really cool guy. Really cool guy. Wow. Wow. He's like yeah, my ultimate guest to have on actually. Yeah, <laughs> I wish I could help you. <laughs> no, no, uh, it, it's one of those things, um, you know, I've been taking small steps. Just, uh, yeah, st this started out just talking to local uh, players, that, friends of mine in Australia who are sort of name players here and it sort of progressed from there. But in the back of my yeah. mind, it's like, you know, I'd like to be able to get to that point where it, I could contact Mark Knopfler and have him on for a chat. And I always thought that would be completely unattainable, but you never know, man. You never know. He is very, very nice. He's very, very nice. Very English, you know, but, um, but he really, really. And I find that most people in this business on that level are very, very nice. It's the people, uh, people that are on their way up or on their way down that you have to look out for, but the people who have figured out where the people who figured out what their careers are, are typically very, you know, you know, we do a Billy Corgan signature model and we have another one coming out this year. And I am often accosted with people with Corgan questions like, oh, boy, that's got to be difficult. No, Billy is very, very professional. Wow. And he knows, he knows exactly what his art is. He knows exactly what he's trying to achieve. And he knows what he likes and what he doesn't like. And that can be very liberating when, when, you're, when you're working with an artist, especially when you're doing something you know, design wise with somebody because, you know, you put it out there. And, and um, one of the things that we pride ourselves here at Reverend with not to get all sales guy about it is, but when we make a signature model for a guy, um, we make the exact guitar that you're playing, that you were seeing them playing. So this, this Reeves Gabrell's uh, dirt bike Royale over my shoulder here, or the Greg Koch models, the, the gristle masters, uh, the Billy Corgan models. These guitars are unmodified by those players when they take them to the stage. So uh, Naylor and I don't make like special custom shop in the dungeon versions of these guitars that the artists are out playing with. And then we're selling something different to the public. Um, we pride ourselves and actually take sometimes too great a pain, I think, in presenting the artist with that guitar. So if you're going to go and spend the money if you're a big Cura fan or a big Reeves fan, you know, Tin Machine fan, whatever it is, 
and you see Reeves playing that that you know his RG one signature model with the Sustainiac, or you see Billy playing his Turs or his or this new guitar that that's coming out this year. When you call up your local retailer, um, you know whether it's it's music and and audio in Australia. I know they distribute to a lot of different people down there. Or, you know, here in the States, you know, any Wildwood guitars or Sweetwater, or any of the musician's friend, whatever, Joe's Music, my local guys, um, that guitar that they're selling is not only the exact same specifications that the artist is playing, but set up even the same way. We put Reeves's uh, preferred string gauge on his guitars before we ship them. And the whole idea behind that is, is Billy's in Australia touring, right? And say something happens to his rig say somebody steals his number one guitar or whatever, he can call our dealer distributor down there and get a guitar and just walk it right out to the stage. Um, I think it's cool and and it, it's it's interesting. So to bring that back around, so with Corgan, uh, when the signature model thing came up with Billy, he had been working for Naylor, with Naylor for a few years on a couple of different projects and, and, and Joe made him a couple of, not they're not quite baritones, but they're 20, five and three quarter inch guitars that were tuned to D standard that we made custom for him in the Oceana era. And he knew Joe and he liked Joe's design ability. And he said, yeah, if you guys, you know, you want to do a signature guitar with me. And he said to Naylor, his guidance was, you know what I like, which was just okay. So he, he, he kind of liked what we did. And Joe came up with that design for that Billy Corgan model and he just crushed it. And, um, and Billy right away loved the looks of it, had a minor cosmetic change to the pick guards. And then we got into pickup territory and we, we did pickups for a few months um, until we completely nailed the pickup sound that he was, the modern sound that he was looking for. And, um, and when we hit it, we hit it. He was just like, oh yeah, that's it. And, uh, and then that was it. And the guitar went into production. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's, it's interesting, you know? Um, it's such a most big departure. Of the guys... Sorry, man. I was just going to yeah. say it's such a big departure from yeah. his uh, Stratocaster. You know, everyone knows Billy as being a Strat guy. So sure. when I saw sure. that he had a Reverend guitar and, and I looked at it, I went, wow, that's you know, two humbuckers rather than the three single coils, etc." So he never used the middle pickup on his Strat. Ah. It was always just sort of in his way and put down. And, and, and he also never used the in-between positions. You know, he, he was either just bridge or net. Um, and, and it's interesting because the, the first prototype that we made to just kind of get, dip our toe in the water with him was we were making a, a model called the six gun with three single coils at the time. And it was our body shape, Karina body, um, uh, maple neck. And we got a set of his DiMarzios and we put them in our guitar and it was a muddy mess. And those DiMarzio pickups of Corgans are brilliant because they take a Strat and make it sound huge. And you need that extra gas. And then I, I love Strats, man. I have tons of them. But they, they're they not big, fat guitars. That's not what they're known to do. And Corgan's sound is massive. And when we put those same pickups in in uh, our sort of hardtail format with the Karina body, um, there are so many you know harmonics in such a a, a more intense mid range, I guess, with the Karina than there is in in the Alder of of his his old his original you know guitar that it, they they just didn't translate. And so we were able to sort of play around with a bunch of different things. And then when we found out that you know he wasn't married to the single coils, he was like, no, no, I clean slate. And we were like, oh, clean slate, here's this. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was awesome. So, um, and this this guitar that we have coming out with him. So now, so then this this is how it, it changes. And um, I've had this this talk with, with a number of our artists too. Um, I don't think that the signature model necessarily needs to be um, a snapshot of any particular moment in time. Um, I like to view them as kind of fluid. So Billy takes that guitar out and tours with it. And it's been out for five years and he's done lots of shows with those guitars. 
And what he has discovered in doing so, uh, in having having it on the road, is that the Billy Corgan model that we've been making up to this point, what we call the BC1, um, Billy thinks is the best guitar for like modern guitar sounds. He thinks it is an ultra modern guitar. The issue that he was having, it wasn't really an issue. It's just that when he would tune it down a half a step and go to play some of his early 90s material, um, it it wasn't he wasn't able to really get that tone exactly where he wanted it. And so he asked us to do a second guitar for him that would approach that sound. And then he wanted to ha have them both on the road, you know, and play one for the earlier stuff. Um, and then one for his, his later stuff and his modern stuff. And so that's why we have a second version of his guitar coming out um, to sort of address that thing. And, and with other artists, like uh, guys that we've been working with for a long time, like, like Rick Vito, um, his needs have changed over the years. Or and same thing with Pete Anderson. Over the years, they've done... Their, their career has taken them into different things and what they think is important to them has changed. And so we've allowed the guitars to change right along with them. Um, whether that means we've discontinued something that we used to do and we've just updated it, or sometimes like in the case of Billy, we're gonna keep the original model around because it was so groundbreaking and did so well for us that I, I, I hesitate to just leave it behind. And because he has indicated that he's gonna be using them both, I figure we can offer both, you know? Um, so yeah, the, the signature model thing is, is definitely a lot of fun. Hey, dude, I warned you, I will blather on. Feel free to interrupt me anytime. That is perfectly fine <laughs> by me, Ken. That's what we're here yeah. for, man. That's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I was going to ask you, like with so many great endorsers yeah. on, on the, on the books, yes. yeah. are they people that have come to you? Are they people that you've crossed paths with along the way? And, and you're going, Hey, by the way, check these out or. How does it generally come about? You know what's amazing? The vast majority of it has been completely organic. I mean, there's there's a little bit of, and I and some of the bigger players in the industry lost some of the personal touch for a while, and I think they've gotten a little bit better at it now. Um, so there was a little bit of that where there, there were people out there who sort of felt... I, like they weren't getting enough attention or slighted by the people that they used to work with or something that had them sort of looking around. I've, I've run into that a few times, but um, there, there's a lot of different ways that we've come by endorsers. So the first big endorser that we had was Ron Ashton from the Stooges, right? And Ron um, is an Ann Arbor guy and that's where Naylor is from. And, uh, and when Joe, Joe did Naylor amps um, before, founding Reverend Guitars, and he ended up selling the business to his partner, and that's a whole other big story. But Ron loved Naylor Amps, and Ron loved Joe, and when Joe started doing the guitars originally, Ron was like, yeah, I want to be involved because I think you're cool. And so Ashton is a legend, and that opened a lot of doors for us, right? And then we had this Kid Rock thing at the very beginning, and I don't know if you know this or not, but his album went platinum like 17 times or something. I think he says that in lyrics. I make that joke a lot. I don't know if that joke falls flat in Australia or not. Um, <laughs> we haven't talked to him in a very, very long time, but he was a Detroit guy. And at first he, he was, he wanted to, you know, he held the guitar on the cover of his record and whatever people in the States think about his politics now or whatever, I don't care about that. I don't, I'm not involved in that that those I steer clear of those kind of discussions. But at the time he was selling a lot of records and it was a big, it was a big thing for us. You know, people really talked about it. And then we just had this weird, cool sort of word of mouth thing go, go through the industry with a handful of people. And, and, and then there were, there's all these weird little personal connections. Um, the Billy's like media manager, at the time was the sister of a guy I used to be in a band with. And he was a local local player in Detroit, absolutely incredible guitar player named John Speck, um, did a bunch of great bands uh, out of a bunch of great Detroit bands. Um, 
he and I, I was briefly in a band called the Generals from Detroit, and John was in that band for quite a while. And that's where we met and we stayed in touch all these years. And he went on to do a, a band called Horse out of Detroit, which did well, and Hi Fi Hand Grenade, a band called The Fags, which did very well. Um, and his sister worked for Billy, and she planted a bug in his ear about something. And that was how Naylor originally met him and was able to get him guitars. So it was, it was, it was weird and and you know it's and so there were there's a lot of a lot of stories like that and then um a lot of like uh as things grew uh, we started doing some stuff with the drive-by truckers and um we went to see them at a show joe did actually with a guy that that used to work for joe steve many years ago and while they were showing the the drive-by truckers were touring with the black crows while they were showing the drive-by guys guitars oddly freed from the black crows came over was interested in something got it we struck up a friendship with oddly freed oddly brought reeves gabrels to us in an am show to check our stuff out and we have now had a 15 year relationship with reeves gabrels which is amazing and so it the you know it's it's weird and i like i could everybody that we work with there's this like weird little story like that where it yeah. just like I said, it just happens sort of organically. And I've always found too, that when people come to you and they're interested, um, it's easier for me to develop a relationship with them. Cold calling guitar players is hard, you know, because everybody like, everybody has their thing that they like that you're not going to be able to talk them out of, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and I love it when people say shit to me, people say the funniest stuff to me, like, like, like people who are, in this like once you get in this you have the like a, a different perspective of it you know what i mean and then guitar players are watching your show so i know guitar players know exactly what i'm talking about like 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 my parents friends will be like well you should really get that carlos santana playing your guitars because he is just he's just a hell of a player and he's so popular boy i mean I, he would do really yeah i'm just gonna you know i'm just gonna get carlos yeah 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 oh yeah, yeah. Like, that's yeah. gonna be like such an easy thing to do you know and uh it, it doesn't quite work that way um but we we don't i mean when we do a signature model with the artist obviously the um the signature model the there's a percentage or whatever you know that because we are using the artist's name to promote our brand obviously they get paid on the sales of the guitar that bears their name right that's the thing but outside of that like i don't, I don't we don't keep like i don't i'm not big enough to like have somebody on payroll or whatever so the people who are playing our guitars are playing them because they love them um and greg too greg is a great example of this just sort of organic thing um uh, we have a huge dealer here in the States called Wildwood Guitars, and there is just a really, really cool guitar store out in the middle of Colorado, USA. And um, Greg has been doing their demo videos for years. And Wildwood has got an incredible website and an incredible web presence and an incredible YouTube presence. And, and I think they still do, but for a while they were doing these serial number videos. And um, this was a lot of fun for me. They would they would order um they really helped us grow our business quite a bit and and I, for them i i'm eternally grateful uh and when we when they came on as a dealer uh and we would do like a the pete anderson model they would order the pete anderson model in a custom color and they would ask me how many it would take to be worth my while and then they would order like 25 40 50 guitars from me um in order to have an exclusive on a color and then i would fly out to their store with that artist so like pete anderson and i would meet in colorado and pete would shoot 40 demo videos for him just with the guitar and just yeah. be like hi i'm pete anderson and i'm hanging out at while i'm doing my pete anderson imitation i'm hanging out while with guitars and i got serial number you know 15 498 and you know here's what it sounds like this that this that and then they would put that little video up on their website with the guitar and then if you're a fan of pete's or just a fan of guitar playing or whatever the video of pete anderson playing your guitar is still on youtube 15 years later that's rad you know that is and it very was, cool it was such very a cool, cool concept and it's such a fun thing to be a part of and i took 
I've been out there with with Gil Paris and uh, Bob Balch and and Pete Anderson, Rick Vito, uh, Reeves Gabrels, and and I have been out there a number of times together doing these things. And then Greg was sort of like their in house guy. He would go out there once a month and just shoot tons of videos of wild because Wildwood sells. You know, they're like they're the state's biggest Gibson custom shop dealer, Fender custom shop dealer, and they get all these crazy guitars there. And Greg is the guy that that sits and demos all of these 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 guitars, and so um, Greg was shooting some reverence once when I was there, and Greg and I just started doing some banner back and forth, like oh, you know, and 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 then making jokes with each other, or whatever. And Steve from Wildwood is like, Ken, why don't you pull up a chair and just sit up there next to him, and uh, we, let's give you a guitar. Can you wire him up and blah blah blah? Because you guys are funny together. And we were like, yeah, okay, you know, and and, uh, and now Greg and I have been doing videos together for, uh, I don't know, going on 10 years. <laughs> awesome. And, and we, have, we have the most incredible fun. And then that turned into, um, and I love it when he tells the story because he tells it better than I am because he's way funnier than me. And uh, he's almost as good of a player as I am too. Uh, <laughs> Just kidding, <laughs> dude. It, it's awesome. I, I get asked all the time, like, "How can you sit and play with him?" And I go, "Oh, I, I don't even have to." The dude is so good, you don't even feel like, like, what am I gonna really like riff like with? I'm not gonna go head to head with this dude. I'll sit here and play some chords and and yeah. have some fun with the guy. But there's no way it's not intimidating at all. Because, I mean, it's intimidating as hell. But but I mean, I he's he's so fun and easy to get along with. And we had some, we, we just developed this really good rapport doing that stuff. And, um, and he had some ideas for a guitar and he just said, you know, after many years of doing these videos and playing all these different brands, um, you know, every time those Wildwood guys hand me one of your guitars, it plays great in some tune and it's just set up perfect. And that's one of the things that we do here that we take a lot of pride in. And he's like, I, I just. I've never played a bad one. I just think they're great. And if you guys would ever be interested in doing something with me, you know, I, I've got, you know, a couple of ideas and I would be into it. And I, I called Joe. I'm like, dude, I, and Joe's, and Joe says, so I've got Greg here at Reverend and we're doing demos and we have that conversation. And I step outside of this room and go into my office and I call Naylor and I'm like, Joe, you know, I, I was just talking to Greg and, and he said he might be interested in doing a signature model. We should probably talk about that. And Joe's like, oh, yeah, I could I could see where this was going with you guys. And and uh, you know what? I, I saw him. He was playing this guitar that he got from somewhere that had these features. And then but I know he likes, you know, tellies. And, you know, I have this idea that we could blah, 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 blah. And he described the Gristle Master to me on the phone. And I'm like, hold on. And I came in here and I had my hey, Greg, it's Naylor. Joe, tell Greg what you just told me. And then I could just see Greg's face light up. And wow. the two of them had a five minute conversation and the guitar was done. We got one prototype. And and that we and it was like, did this just happen? And you know the best things in life happen like that, right? Yeah, they, I mean, they you're do, like, that thing. Absolutely. Like, like the harder you gotta work at something. You and I had this conversation again before we started doing this video. The more prepared you are, the stiffer it is, right? And I, I feel that way about, about some of this stuff. Like if you have a good idea, it just happens, Yeah, you know? And, uh, and, and that was that it just happened. It was so amazing. And um, so, yeah, so that's how the signature models come about in like every possible way. You know, there's not a lot of people that I set out to get that I get a lot of the times they just find me. A good example of a guy we set out to bring into the fold is Bob Balch from Fu Manchu. Cool. Because Naylor and I are just huge Foo fans. And they were coming to Detroit and we went to show him guitars. And he loved he loved us. And it, it just clicked. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh and and then and again, we have been working with him for 15 years. You know, another thing that I'm really proud of here is that is that these guys stay with us. We must be doing something right. Well, man, I just had a look at the website before, and I didn't realize there were so many signature guitars. Uh, you got yeah, Robin, Robin Fink. I'm a big Nine yeah, Snails Robin's fan. Awesome. And, yeah, I yeah. Was a... it, the, and the the Robin story is is one of my employees. My one of my sales guys um, is a huge, huge Nine Inch Nails fan, 
and reached out to Robin on social media and invited him to come visit our booth at the NAMM show. And he did. Wow. Wow. And then he knew, of course, he knows Reeves, you know, because he and Reeves have played together yeah. and all this. So he knew about us or whatever. And uh, and he got a couple of guitars and one thing led to another. And here we are. Awesome. You know, and Robin is Robin is awesome. I mean, he's he's a pro, you know, he's one of those people that's just like he just has it. He's a rock star, man. It's he's well, just you, awesome. You don't get the gigs that he gets unless you are. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> yeah, you I've actually yeah, exchanged right. a couple of and emails he's... with Robin about him coming on the show. So uh, he was oh, very yeah. busy at the time, but I'm going to reach out to him again yeah. soon and see how he's going. Do it. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. He's so nice. Such a nice dude. Truly. Millie Brosh told me that and she Truly put me in gentleman. touch with him. And uh, she said, oh, man, Robin's fantastic. I'll, I'll set up an email uh, introduction for you. Yeah. So you've, you've mentioned cool. Joe Naylor quite a few times. And I know the name yeah, Joe Naylor through the the amplifier side of things but do you mind yeah. running us through how the company started with with joe yeah no no problem um so joe uh <laughs> joe was born and raised in ann arbor michigan and he went to Mester, western michigan university and got an engineering and commercial design degree and while he was at college he got the electric guitar bug um which is interesting because most people get bit by it much younger yeah, and yeah. joe's very analytical and right away he was taking them apart and trying to make them better and he had a long history of doing that he worked at a schwinn bike shop for years and just he mod joe mods everything in his life <laughs> nothing <laughs> i've enough. seen joe i you know you know those globes that have lights inside of them i've seen joe mod a globe um he he's that he's he's crazy he's awesome and so when the guitar bug bit him hard and when he graduated from college, he then went to a school in America called the Roberto Van School of Lutheran. And it's out in um, out in Arizona and where you, you go through a whole program and, and you build an acoustic and build an electric guitar as your sort of final project. And after he did that, he came back to the Detroit area and he opened up a small um, sort of a guitar repair shop and a buy, sell, trade thing. Um, started getting into the vintage side of things a little bit and very quickly developed a reputation as being sort of a master guitar tech in the Detroit area. And all the local musicians would take their old beat up guitars to him and he'd get them stage ready and take them up. And then he really liked the challenge of, of modding, you know, old like 60s unplayable guitars, taking stuff that was broken or beat up and making them stage worthy. And in throughout the process of doing this, he, he discovered stuff that he thought really worked from different brands and came up with the idea for the original Reverend guitar. And he liked offset waists and things, and that was sort of um, where the design started. So I've got one. I'm going to walk out of frame. You go for and, it. Which is so rude. Oh, you no. How rude. Well, we're going to have a look around your room while you're not there. I'll get rid of me. And then oh, yeah. Yeah, here that. you go. So this, this is cool. This is a really cool piece of Reverend history. This is Ron Ashton's Avenger. After Ron passed away, his sister gave this back to us. Wow. To have. She wanted us to have it. Yeah. Um, and this was the original design. So Joe started nailer amps first because he felt a need for hand wired high gain tube amps and he was a little bit ahead of the curve and this was i think maybe matchless was around um bogner was just kind of getting going this is the early 90s right yeah and uh he and but none of these companies were huge there were a handful of these guys making really nice boutique camps and joe worked with a guy in detroit named dan russell who's a, a brilliant tube amp uh engineer uh repair guy um still around up there does does he's amazing and joe and joe has the ear so joe kept describing to dan what he wanted to hear and dan knew how to make it happen and they they developed the nailer super drive 60 together in the super club 38 and they went to market with them and at the time people were like 
well, I'm not paying $2,500 for a half stack. I can go to Guitar Center and get a Marshall for $1,000, you know? And Joe's like, it's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and, uh, and so they had a, a, an issue. They couldn't sell them cheap enough in order to move a ton of them. And they were having a hard time. So the market wasn't established for that. Now you drop, I could drop five grand on an amp in 30 seconds. You know what I mean? Just like it's insane the, where that market is, is gone. But, but at the time, and, and you remember a couple grand was a lot more money then in the States than it is now too. So um, he ended up get, getting out of that business. He sold the business to his partner and then it, it went under and, and, um, Somebody is keeping the brand name here alive in the States at the moment. It is what it is. But Joe's passion was the guitar. And he had the idea for this brewing in his head the whole time the Nailer Hand thing was going on. And this is an Avenger. And the way these guitars work is um, the outside of the body is a one-piece mold-injected plastic rain. And then the wow. inside is a six-inch wide block of Karina. And the tops and the backs are countertop. They're like, uh, we got them from Formica. Um, so they're mostly wood with a very thin layer of plastic on the outside. Wow. And then the necks are, are, are bolt-on maple necks. And so Joe made the bodies at the shop in Detroit. And the necks and the pickups, um, we actually got from Mir Music in Korea, um, who are making the guitars now. Um, eventually, we went through a few different suppliers before we settled on them. And, um, and so there's no, there was no paint in the process of building these at our facility in the Detroit area. They were, they were assembled and we had a mold made to make the rings and through, so the first seven years of Reverend's history were largely spent around making the, these guitars, Joe forayed back into amps and pedals, and then sort of realized that, um, that that guitar was really where he wanted to be and sort of doubled down on this. Um, these had a couple of years where they paid the bills. And the bottom line is, no matter how much everybody out there, if you're, you know, if you follow us and, and you know you're familiar with these guitars, no matter how much out there everybody says that they want one now, the bottom line is, is by 2005, we couldn't give them away. Wow. And, and they're, they're awesome, but they're not bright enough for country and they're not focused and tight enough for rock or metal because they're all semi hollow. So they really, they're a really neat platform for any pickups that you put in them. But whatever pickups you put in them, it sounds like the guitar that you traditionally associate with the pickups mixed with like a 335. You know what I mean? Yep. So they're terrific guitars for blues guys. Just And like Vito. Vito made them sound magical with playing like his his slide blues and stuff. And he still uses his some of his early ones quite a bit. Um, really, really cool guitars. But the, and the, the flip side of that too, and not to be all like marketing guy about it or whatever, but guitar players are weird, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm talking to you. Yeah. You. Um, you know, it, people want to, they want to see Flame Maple and they want to see 60s car colors. And that was just so far outside of the box that mo so the target audience that that guitar worked the best for were the guys buying the custom shop guitars. You know what I mean? And they're the guys that, that, that were, you know, uh, they just looked and I mean, I had a great story about this. Yeah. Uh, just old British empire stuff. There's a band from Canada called the tragically hip. And they're like one of my favorite bands of all time. Yep. And the first time I met them to show them guitars, I showed them one of those and their lead guitar player, Rob Baker walked out on stage, saw it on a stand and went, Oh, I'm not into the plastic guitar thing and walked away. What? And that was it. I never even, I never even got it in his hands. And that in a nutshell is the story of us trying to sell those guitars as cool as they were. It was, it was an uphill battle with the, with the, the non-traditional thing. 
And um, so, and then there's, there's the flip side. So, so Joe then had these ideas for these solid body instruments, uh, some of which you see behind me now um, over, I keep holding up the wrong hand, which is funny, <laughs> I, I saw but the jet stream, uh, the, the charger body, which the Jen Wasner is, um, and the Sensei, which is the Dirt Bike Deluxe is based on, he had the idea for these guitars, but we weren't cnc and carving things and painting things in our shop. And so he started looking for somebody to build these guitars. And one of the first people that he approached, of course, was Mirror Music in Korea, who were doing the necks and the pickups right. We knew we loved the necks. And um, he had them make some prototypes of these guitars, some of the body shapes of which we still make. And we got those guitars and were like very quickly realized that they were pretty awesome. Wow. And I got to admit, I was like skeptical. You're like, what do you mean? I, Cause I loved them. You know what I mean? And yeah. I made them work, you know, and yeah. I, I, and I play rock and shit and I, I was, I was making it work. Um, and uh and joe joe gave me a warhawk one of our early warhawk models and he just said just take this out and gig with it and i took it out and i did one gig and i mean one song into one gig i was like oh oh shit yeah these pickups sound really good in a solid body like wow this is really nice and it just because the the bridge and the pickups and the neck were so familiar to me i was just getting this oomph you know and I was like, yeah, we got something here. And Joe was like, yeah, and I can sell it for this. And I was like, oh, dude, yeah, we got to do that, you know? Um, and so for a while, we offered both things at the same time. And then we went on about a 90-day stretch where we didn't even take an order from one of our original models. That combined with the fact that the mold that made the plastic ring, so this is a manufacturing in America story, um, when we first started having that done, there were all these plastic plants in Detroit that were making car parts, incidental stuff for car interiors or whatever, you know what I mean? And they, you know, had the polystyrene blend that Joe wanted them to use to make the ring and they had the mold and the first company went out of business and, and the mold had to get packed up and moved somewhere else. And then that company went out of business and the mold had to get packed up and moved somewhere else. And then that company kept getting these little bubbles in it and the, it had to be perfect and so then that company packed up the mold and it ended up in central Ohio with the place that actually makes the logos for Fender Apps, which is hilarious. Um, and by that time, the mold needed repairs and the repairs were really expensive. And um, we just weren't selling enough guitars to, uh, to justify keeping the mold. And so we went full bore and committed to our new line, which at the time we were calling the Stage King series, which was the Warhawk, the Jetstream, the Charger, and the Club King, and we doubled down on it. So, um, so just to sort of bring it all home for you, um, I started with Joe in the late '90s as an endorser, and I was playing in a couple of local bands in Detroit, and I just happened to buy one of his guitars used in a music store and it wasn't that used it was only like a year old and i was like oh east point michigan that's right over there where's that you know and and i looked up joe in the phone book i don't know if you're old enough to remember what a phone book I, is. i'm not far um, behind you mate. It, don't let the beard die uh fool you <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went and introduced myself to him. And at the time I was, I was playing in bands and I was selling automotive paint and sandpaper. And I figured he probably used sandpaper and polish somewhere in the process. And uh, I just went and cold called him uh, with the company that I was working for. And he started buying bits and pieces of, of, of sandpaper and things like that for me. And then he and I struck up a friendship and he took me as a guest to uh, the NAMM show, our big trade show here in the US um, in the summer of 99, I believe it was. And I was getting, I was just shy of turning 30 years old. And I was, I was married and had a beautiful daughter 
and I had like a career in the paint business and right. And I, I was a good sprayer, I guess, you know, <laughs> I mean, but I sold paint I called on body shops and I sold paint and trained people how to paint cars and, and I couldn't stand the smell of the stuff. And I really liked, I made good money. I really liked that part of it, you know, but I really liked guitar and I just being in Detroit, I could never make it work, I guess, whatever. Um, when I went to the NAMM show with Joe, I'll never forget the moment I, I stood at the top of the, the escalator. In Nashville, you used, there was a place where you could stand and you could see over the top of the whole floor. And I looked over the whole floor and I, I, I knew it right then and there. I'm like, oh, I belong here. This, this, I'm doing the wrong, th I, I fucked up. I, sorry. I, 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 I just started going down the wrong path. And I'm 30 years old and it's not too late. It can't be, you know, which it sounds so corny, but it's true. And um, and so Joe, then at that show, I sold one of these guitars to a, a guitar player named Will Ray. Are you familiar with Will? He was one of the Helicasters. Yeah, yep, yep. And Will and I are about, Will and I are the same height. We're each about 6'6". Six, six. Uh, Greg is 6'7", by the way. I've met Greg, and um, he, I'm 6'3", man, and he dwarfed me. And I was going to ask oh, yeah. you how tall you were because I saw, I've saw i seen pictures of you two guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Will is also in our club. And uh, and and we saw each other. And we, oh, you're Will from the Tall Guy Club. Yeah, Ken. Yeah, how are you? And um, But anyways, Will, Will is – he's another one of these great – these funny stories. Guitar guys love guitars. I'm talking to you. Um, he saw my badge and he was like, Reverend Guitars, what's that? And I was like, oh, man – you got to see these things. So he takes this guitar and we've got this block of wood and blah, blah, blah. And I described it all to him and I was all excited about it, you know, and I was like sales guy, you know, and, and, and Rick and Will was like, dude, I, uh, I, I got to check him out. So like an hour later or whatever, I, I wander back to the Reverend booth and there is Will writing Joe a check for some guitars. And Will points at me and he goes, oh, there he is. There's Ken. Yeah. He's a real nice guy. He told me all about you. And, uh, and Will leaves. And Naylor looks at me and goes, dude, how'd you do that? And I was like, I, I really don't know. I still don't know. I mean, I just, I'm a fan of the dude. You know what I mean? I was excited to meet him. He asked me about you. I was excited to tell him about you. And Joe said, you're coming to every single one of these with me from now on. And I, so I, he, he couldn't afford to hire me. You know, the company was very small and very young and it was in the, it was literally in the back of a one car garage wow. uh, at the time. It was in the back of a bike shop and it, it was, it was like a one car garage stall with a bunch of equipment in it and a little office, you know? And, um, but he started taking me to trade shows and I loved it. And I, and, and he paid me in guitars and I still have tons of them and I would just go and sell stuff for him. And, and uh, we, we had a lot of fun with that. So then my paint career, I, I was really getting more and more disgruntled with it as we got into the early 2000s. And I finally gave it up and I started a small business of my own um, doing wholesale car stuff. I was buying cars at auction and selling them to other dealers. And I had a little retail lot that didn't do a lot of business and most of it was wholesale. And I knew a lot about cars and paint and stuff. So I had this background in it. And I got a couple of years into that business and just, just decided I hated the car business. The car business sucks. Everybody, everybody thinks you're you're full of shit in the car business because so many people in that business are, and it just and I'm not like I'm on I'm telling you stuff. I some, sometimes one of the reasons why I don't watch the playbacks on those is like oh my god I can't believe I told this. What did I just say? Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but I just I'm just here I am man. You know this is what I do. So I I became very disgruntled with the car business and then. Joe had decided to transition the line and I wasn't working for him full time when he made that decision. And, um, I, the first NAM show that we had these stage King guitars to sell, um, I went into that show and I was pretty excited about them. Um, I had just started playing a couple gigs with them and I really loved my jet stream and, and I worked out a deal with Joe where, um, I would work for him for X amount of time and he would uh, give me X number of guitars. 
And I said, you know, instead of me just coming to the trade show with you, let me work for you for a couple of weeks before and and week after and really set up appointments and really be professional about it and really do, you know, do what I would do if I was working for you full time. And I did that and I opened up close to 30 dealers, including Better Music in Australia, who ordered like 400 some guitars from us. Wow. And Joe was so blown away. Um that he's like, dude, I have to hire you now because these people are going to be expecting you, you know, to do this. And I was like, yay, you know, because it, it's really, it was, it was where I wanted to be. So finally, you know, at, um, at, you know, 35 years old, now I'm working for a guitar company doing sales. And we did really, really well for a couple of years. Uh, and and then we had this sort of economic reset, the Great Recession, they call it here in the States. And at the time, we were selling in mostly indie stores and small stores, and a lot of those guys went under. Um, and Joe had done this with this business a few times. You know, he sort of launched the, the original guitars, and then they sort of waned, and then he launched this, and now we were having problems due to economic forces um nothing to do with the guitars and he was just sick of it he designed guitars and works on guitars and that's what he liked to do and running a business and paying taxes and doing payroll and shit was just getting him down and so he decided he wanted out and he was looking at people to buy the company from him um and he was looking at bigger brands and a lot of these brands would come in and they would say joe oh, you're a brilliant designer and look at these products that you've made and you've done so well with them. And, 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 you know, we're going to keep you on And Ken, you have these artist relation contacts and you know, the dealers and we're going to keep you on. But the reality of it is, and I had been around the business long enough to know at the time by then, after going to trade shows for 10 or 12 years, that brands get folded into other brands and all those original people all disappear because anybody who's going to come in and, and buy us, they have their own salespeople and their own designers who obviously know way more than we do. And, and so um, I just couldn't bear it. And it, this was late 2009. I had just turned 40. And I thought, no, I, I, I can't start over again at 40. I'm finally doing what I want to do with my life. And so um, I, I sat down with my wife, Penny, and Miss Penny came to all most of the NAM shows with me and Joe and, and helped us. And she was great at, um, we would say, Penny would set them up and I would knock them down. Um, my wife is very, very charming and she would talk to guys and, uh, and keep, and keep them interested until we could, you know, till we could get to them. That was how she started. And then eventually she's just closing people left and right, you know, because that's once she knew about the product, she became infinitely more dangerous once she figured out what was going on. And she's a musician and a guitar player herself uh, in no short order. So um, we had this like we had a really good rapport and Penny was active in the business without being an employee. Um, so I went to Penny and said, we should buy this. And she said, you're crazy. And I said, I know. Um, but I think we can borrow money from this person and borrow money from this person. And I sat down with a, a business advisor guy who helped me when I had the car business. And we came up with a way to do it. And we presented an offer to Joe, which included employment for Joe and, and, um, and kept his involvement. Because really... And Joe's the mastermind behind the designs of all the guitars. Joe is the guy that can sit down with an artist and listen to them say the most incredible things that I don't even understand. Uh, Corgan said to Joe, I really like the clarity of these pickups, but they're missing a little bit of that Sabbath girth, that mud, that dirt. And, and Joe's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I got it. I got it. And as we walked away, I said to Joe, he just told you that he want, didn't want to lose the clarity, but wanted him to have less clarity. And Joe's like, yeah, but I know what he means. And I was like, I'm glad you do. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, Joe, I needed Joe. We, Penny and I weren't going to do this without, yeah. Yeah. without Joe. Hmm. And so we figured out a way to do it. And Penny and I bought the company from him. And we took it over in January of 2010. And 
we then within a couple of years realized that we figured out what everybody's strengths were. And then everybody could sort of lean into their strengths. And I'm not some like wizard businessman. I'm just very, very passionate about what I do. And I'm willing to put in the time because I like it. You know what I mean? And, and, it, and, you know, I'm, I spend way too much time sitting at my desk doing payroll and taxes and all this <laughs> crap, but, um, but I get to sit here and talk to you and, and everything in this room is ours and it's amazing. You know what awesome. I mean? Yeah. And, um, and I, and, and, you know, so we're, we're like, so here we are 12, you know, 12 years later, uh, and we're getting ready to celebrate our 25th anniversary and we've done nothing, but we started, um, we started this company by figuring out how small we could be and still pay the rent, keep the doors open and keep our head tech Zach green. And for a year, it was just me and Zach Green plugging away, plugging away. And then we've slowly added people. And now, um, and then we were, and we're still small by industry standards, by the way. It's so funny being being in a business where my competitors are Fender and Gibson and they make in a day what I make in three months or yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, but um, we started doing, you know, with, with me and Zach in the building and Penny working from home doing marketing stuff and and Joe working from home doing design stuff. And we were putting out about 125 guitars a month and we have grown that into, um, you know, 650, 700 guitars a month, 13 wow. employees. And it is, and, and, you know, that artist roster you were talking about and all this stuff and, and it's, it's great. And, um, getting Joe out of the office, then Joe came around and did s some of the best work of his entire life. Um, almost immediately, we had uh, bases, and and then you know that was followed up with the with a new model for Rick Vito, and then and then it just kept like one thing after another. You know, um, just all these great great guitars and new designs and cool stuff. Uh, rail hammer pickups were developed right out of the gate. As soon as Joe was freed up from all this, he's like, he had a pickup idea that he had been working on in the back of his head for years. And then once he didn't have this, um, you know, weighing on him, then he went and did, got the patent for the pickups. And, and now the rail hammer thing has fallen under the fold of the Reverend family because he grew that to the point where the managing it day to day became more than it was worth. You know what I mean? And so yeah. we brought that into the fold here. And obviously we have a lot of our signature models or signature artists use rail hammer pickups as well, but we do well with rail hammer pickups even as its own uh, entity. And um, yeah, I mean, that's our story. That's, that's, that's what put me here. And, and, uh, and it's still, it's, it's still humming along, man. It's, it's, it's awesome. Cool. And it's a lot. But it is awesome. Now, I was going to ask you about Rail Hammer pickups because I, I realize that you're the yeah, CEO, CEO of them as well. But before I go there, um, you were saying about having the, the guitars built offshore. Do they do the whole thing there or do they send them to you in a no. almost done state and then you guys finish the job? How does all that work? Uh, they're basically done there. So Mir, Mir's in Korea, in South Korea, and they – build guitars for other brands, um, not as much as they used to. Uh, so, but, but you can look them up M I R R and you can see stuff that they do. And, um, cause so that I don't have to, <laughs> 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 and, um, but, but it's not world music. Uh, there, there's another large, very large factory in Korea that makes guitars for, for, you know, ESP and Schechter and PRS and stuff. It's not those guys. It's a, it is a smaller shop and, and they're, we are the vast majority of their business at this point. Um, and they, um, they have done very, very well at realizing Joe's vision. And it's interesting because even with the older guitars, I think the necks and the pickups, that's big stuff. And having them, having that stuff done going into the working relationship, I think was, was a huge deal. Um, but then we, they just, they make really good guitars. They're, they're uncompromising. You know what I mean? Um, it's so hard in this day and age 
to uh, to look at country of origin and come up with some sort of opinion. You really have to. Um, you really it, what really matters is the quality control that people want to hold these factories to. Because I'm seeing I'm seeing some brilliant guitars coming out of China at incredible price points now, and I'm. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Very true. Um, very and, true. And and in you know what what Ibanez is doing in Indonesia is very impressive. Um, there's you know it, it's funny in in the U.S. Uh, people's um, there there's a lot of like jingoism here, you know, and all oh, United U.S. guitars, U.S. guitars, and because Fender and Gibson have had such an impact. In the global guitar industry that that yeah i mean everybody everybody can you know it's being like in the car business and talking about you know gm and ford i mean these companies are so big and they're so global that that in, if you're going to enter that market you have to live in this umbrella with these bohemians right so it's um it's very and and then these guys make guitars in all price points and because they make guitars in all price points, they go to different regions of the world in order to sort of accomplish that. And then these regions of the world get associated with those price points. That's what we've done in the guitar business. And um, and then there's companies out there that sort of shatter that mold. What Joe and I want to do is make solid mid-priced guitars that are totally pro ready and road ready and so mir makes the guitars from beginning to end and they um when we get them they're finished they're painted they're strung up uh we change the strings often uh but they they've been using diodario xls at the factory um there which are the same strings that we get that we stock here um, so we don't always have to change the strings, but often we pull the strings. Um, and we do complete setups on the instruments. And this isn't like open up the box and go, looks good. I mean, yep. this is like, we we do all the nut work here. Um, and we're very specific about it. Uh, we set up the Wilkinson Trems here. We set up the Bigsby's here and make sure all the rollers are functioning properly. Uh, pick up heights, pull piece heights. Joe has very specific ways that in very specific measurements for each individual guitar, not just the signature models, but even different pickups and different models and things that he wants to see work, you know? Um, and so we have our shop, we have seven guys in the back and they go, we have pre setup guys and finish setup guys and the finish setup guys write the serial numbers and sign their initials to the backs of the headstocks and all the serial numbers are sequential uh from when we started so i have here i have a new uh this is a new tommy coffin signature model and look at that old sparkle this is serial number forty seven thousand eight hundred and twenty four so we have made forty seven thousand eight hundred and twenty four guitars in the last 25 years and uh this is one of this was just set up friday um wow. and so uh, so we get them done and then we do it. And then from here, then they all go back all over the world, which uh, is something that our Australian distributor often wants to talk to me about because you're right south of where the guitars are made and the guitars come all the way to Toledo, Ohio. But there's something that happens in the shop um, that that is special and that we are still standing behind. And so all the reverends come through this facility and then go back out all over the world. Um, and uh, in what we have found is that Mir was the most capable company to realize our vision for us, you know. Um, and, and obviously there's all these global supply chain issues now and all this stuff going on because of COVID. And one of my favorite things that people say to me recently is, well, I mean, if you're having such a hard time getting the guitars from Korea, why don't you just build them yourself? Well, here, here's why. Mir has been building musical instruments for three generations. And we had an idea for guitars that we were able to tap into 
three generations of building experience to realize our guitars. What am I just gonna match? What am I just gonna magically hire some dudes off the street and be like, yeah, we make guitars here now? Yeah. And what are those gonna be like? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you like, I, I think it's smart to choose like the best person for the job. And we just felt like the way we were doing things made the most sense to us. Um, and so that's why we do it. And I'm, I, you know, I, I used to argue with people in the States more than I do now about that sort of thing, because people would be like, oh, I just don't understand. Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, play one and, and then you'll get it. And then people started playing one and then, and then they get it, you know? And, uh, and like I said, it, it's the standard that we hold them to that makes the instrument what it is. Yep. And we've had like issues over the years that we've had to address, you know, with them. And those are issues that we could have had in house or we could have had with anybody. And then we address the issues and then they go away. And so we have, we have like a really, really good relationship with them. And I think it's awesome. And I think it's awesome that we support all the families that we support here in Northwest Ohio in southeastern Michigan, and then we also help support a bunch of families in Korea, and then we also support um, the all the dealers that sell our stuff all over the world that count on what they make. You know, it's it's like a it's like a everybody's sort of working to like we've created this thing. Yep, and it's so cool. Like, you know, and awesome. so and it's so it's so easy for somebody to go. Well, I don't like the way. You, well, you know, and not everybody has to like it, um, but it works for us, man. And we make like kick ass guitars. Uh, and and that, so to at the that end of the point, day, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Delivering yeah, right, it is. kick ass it's guitar. All about. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Kenny, you, you said and, about and, doing the setups there. Yeah. And then you said yeah. uh, about the crucial nut setup. That's one thing yeah, that sure. I find some manufacturers just completely fuck up. Um, if the nut isn't right, you cannot set your action. Good and low. Now you mentioned two of the, oh. the big brands out there that you're um, that own the market, and I'm not going to say which one. One of them, I I, I absolutely love their style of, of guitar. The other, not so much for me. <laughs> I keep buying these Mexican-made guitars with Floyd roses. I, I love a strap with a Floyd rose, I but then I have a look at the I height know. of the nut, and I'm thinking, no. My understanding is if you press down at the third fret the string should just clear that first, the, the first fret. Now I'm not sure what you, you guys philosophy is on that. Um, yeah. But that's not even close on, on some of these guitars that I've seen out of Mexico. And I'm thinking, does somebody do a setup on these? Like these, give it to me for five minutes. Give me a well, couple no, of they wrenches. Don't. They, and there's, and th that's a, it, that is a economics of scale thing. Um, that was one of our big selling points at first uh, like, you know, I sell to a lot of stores that they, they advertise that they set up all the guitars for people to come in. And one of the first things that I have to do is train their techs to not set up our guitars because they're ready to go. Yeah. And if somebody tells me, oh, the nut slot's too low, you're going to send a replacement nut. And I'm like, why don't you just give the truss rod a quarter turn? And I think you're going to find that it's perfect. Mm. Um, that is why. I, I mean, I argue with people who think that their nut slats are too low all the time. And that is a reason why I think people don't, I think other manufacturers, and especially when you're talking about the quantity of guitars that a company like Fender is putting out, out of Mexico, they can't possibly address that and then have a bunch of, of people come at them and telling them that the nut slots are it's easier for them to have it be too high because it's easier for a dealer to remove a little bit of it than it is to add it in. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think, I think that a lot of that sort of plays into it and you're right. I mean, it's, it is a tricky thing. Uh, but I, I love hearing how well they play, you know, when I send them out to people and that was, that was how Ibanez conquered the U.S. in the 70s, um, was that, you know, the big boys weren't setting up anything and they were making a, a product that was hit and miss. Fender and Gibson made some great guitars in the 70s. I have I have a I have a 78 uh, special that is just awesome. Such a killer guitar. And there's 
so it's it's again it's real easy to say all oh, those companies weren't doing shit in the 70s uh, okay sure they were hit and miss what ibanez did was they brought guys over to the us from japan and they set up all of the guitars here in the states before they shipped into dealers and so if you walked into a music store and grabbed a you know a model 2663 or a custom agent or something off the wall in the late 70s it completely smoked what the the gibson's next to it did playability wise you know yep. um and they built a huge reputation on that and it was part of what got them um you know into the marketplace in the states and nailer's philosophy was much the same you know we we marketed this company to dealers as look they're ready to go right out of the box you don't have to do anything to them yeah so just just take them and sell them yep and um and that worked for us and now we're not the only ones that are doing this i mean there's you know there's a lot of when you, there's an expectation um i think when you get to a certain price point that you're going to get a guitar that's set up but in a lot of cases they're set up by the dealers and there's some dealers out there that do some great work i have absolutely no issue with that at all i think it's awesome um but i am also shocked at the number of you know 5,000 USD guitars that I will pick up that don't stay in tune. Yeah. That, I, that I, I just, I'm just amazed by it, you know? Um, but, and that, that's, but that's not what we do. You know, I mean, I don't, we make guitars to be played, you know, that, that, that is the, the, the goal is to, to have these things go to the stage. I don't necessarily, and I know I get a lot of people that buy the guitars to play on their couch while they're watching TV, and that's great. I do it every night, <laughs> especially for the last two years. But um, but we we make them to go right to the stage, and and uh, and to sort of to wrap up the 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 signature model, and do we build them here? Like question. So these signature models for like Billy and, and Greg and all this stuff that we talked about, Mir makes the prototypes. Joe doesn't sit in his basement and make some magic prototype for this guy. Um, we dial in what the artist wants, and then we send the specifications to Mir and have them make the prototypes. We fly prototypes over here and send them to the art, and I will send. So I'll get in two prototypes or four prototypes for a guy, and I'll send one to Corgan and one to Nailer. And then the two of them screw around with it, and then they compare notes, and then it comes back to me what changes need to be made, if any. Um, and then Mir does another round of prototypes, and then usually by then it's it's a done deal. Um, so that way we know that Mir is building. That way we know that if we had this happen with Gabrels and the Cure, uh, Canadian Customs opened a bunch of guitar cases. True story, on the tarmac in the rain. Oh, when they were going through their gear. This this happened, and this was during uh, these big festivals that happened. It used to happen in North America called Riot Fest. There were Riot Fest last year, but there's one in Toronto and one in Chicago, and the Cure was headlining them both. And they had a bunch of gear get damaged. And when Reeves got to Chicago, he went to Chicago Music Exchange and bought a Jetstream HB off the wall and played it that night with the Cure. Wow. And what, what the uh, fuck it's, with yeah, customs? Awesome. What the fuck? Yeah, isn't that weird? I be, but you know what, dude? I there's I have a million stories like that. It happens. I I. He, damage happens and no matter how careful you are i've got this stupid thing i i'm on uh instagram at haas.ken by the way um and uh, i posted this reel uh over the holidays just screwing around on instagram because i can because i hardly have any gigs anymore and um and uh i posted this reel i i had four bases get completely destroyed by a shipping company here in the states and we don't ship everything in boxes to dealers. Uh, we have these like four pack crates where guitars are double boxed. So they're in, they're bubble wrapped and they're foam, foam wrapped so that they don't get scratched and bubble wrapped and then put into a small box and the, which are thick walled. And then four of these small boxes are put into a bigger box and you get a 60 pound box that has four guitars in it. Um, you know, 45 pounds for guitars and maybe 58 to 60 pounds for bases. And some of our dealers want to get stuff shipped to them that way. 
they don't want to incur the, the costs of shipping everything in cases, or our dealers have their own gig bags that they want to sell. And cases have gotten so we could, I could do an hour show on what a, what a pain in the ass that is from my side of the business. Oh, really? Because cases are, cases are incredibly expensive. Yeah. And I'm, I want to sell these guitars at the price point. I want to sell a thousand dollar guitar here in the States, right? If I was to incorporate the cost of a case into the guitar with economics of scale, that guitar costs $1,250 just to add a, case, a good hard shell case. And um, because we have been selling these guitars for so long at a grand, I can't just have a $250 price increase to add a case. People would think that's crazy, mm. uh, but that would, that would be what it would take. So dealers also, you know, you've got these dealers, they sell Gator cases or SKB cases or reunion blues bags, or there's people that there are all kinds of people out there that make great, great cases and people want options or whatever. So that's fine. So we ship these guitars in, in four packs of dealers and I had a four pack of bases just get wasted. Like, they must have run them over with a truck and they left in that crate and came back to me in one box loose with all the headstocks broken, the necks broken, the next joints broken. One of the bodies was broken in half. I have no idea how they did this much damage, you know, and I have this video up on Instagram and it's going nuts. And, and I get in all these comments about how dumb I am for not shipping them in cases or whatever. And it's like, I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with people online. It's like, that's, it's, it's part of our business model. It's one of the things that we do. It's, it's how people want, like we we're trying to make dealers happy. We're trying to make customers happy. You know, there it, it's, it's, it's a lot. Um, but you just, you never know what you're going to get, you know, um, you never know what you're going to get in shipping stuff. And we just do the absolute best that we can. I don't even know why I went on this tangent. I think it was just like, just funny funny stuff online, you know, and, uh, and this, this, of course, I post all these beautiful videos of like, my guitars and like little demo videos of me playing and, oh, you know, they get like four or 500 likes and five or 10,000 views and everybody blah, blah, blah. And I post a 15 second video of four demolished bases on the floor of my warehouse. And it's got like 200,000 views. Wow, yeah. and like, you know, it's like completely going crazy. And I don't want to be like the broken base guy. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that sucks. That sucks. Totally sucks. Yeah, it's funny. Okay, no, I, I want to ask <laughs> you about behind um, the scenes. I want to ask you a bit more about the Railhammer pickup side of things. Um, yeah, fire, now, fire away. Yeah, so that started out as something hang on let me just change the shot there oh beautiful you can actually that guitar is so shiny that i can see your screen Woo-hoo. yes well yes, there's me <laughs> uh, so that's something that started out um that you guys were making for yourself but do you also sell them to like just on their own to, to other guitar companies yes we yep. when joe started doing them he was um he was selling them to dealers as well as selling them to me uh, so we have a whole dealer network just for pickups and, um, and then a few smaller manufacturers are dabbling in them on things, uh, which is great. I'd like to get more of that happening if I can. Um, the idea is it's, it's a full size humbucker, right? And there are blades underneath of the wound strings and then oversized pole pieces underneath of the plane strings. And the easiest way for me to describe this is, um, if you think of, and this is really, I think what started it for Joe, um, and bless him. Uh, I'm not speaking ill of the dude at all. I'm a huge fan, but if you think of a uh, dime bag, Daryl's guitar sound, yeah. his rhythm sound is so crushing because the blades under the, the wound strings, they take a smaller slice of the magnetic field that's being created by the string. And when you're palm muting and doing percussive stuff, you get this really tight, naturally compressed sound that's very percussive and awesome. And if you think of the way that his tone was, it was crushing, right? On yeah. the rhythm stuff. Yeah. You get to the lead stuff and it can get a little shrill mm-hmm. because those blades are doing the same thing under the plane strings as they are under the wound strings. And so Joe had this idea in his head that in one pickup, he could balance the sweetness of a PAF high end and get that crushing rhythm sound uh, out of the low end of the guitars by having both blades and poles in a pickup. And 
it after some playing around with it, yeah, I mean, they balance and they sound great. And what you end up with is a full size humbucker with all the clarity, like the string to string clarity of a single coil and all the power of a humbucker. Um, wow. it, they're, they're really unique. There's nothing quite like them. They are the, they're easily the most clarity that you will find in a passive pickup. When you start talking about active pickups, you know, I mean, even like the EMGs have blades underneath of that uh, wax potted stuff. That's why they sound so good on the bottom end like that. You know what I mean? But but there's these are still passive pickups, so you don't get that sort of electronic thing mixed in. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. That you do with active and and active stuff has its place. I don't disparage anything. I'm not going to sit here and be like active pickups suck. They don't. They, they they definitely have their place too. And the the fluent stuff that we're doing with Greg is awesome. You know, um, but that that wasn't what that wasn't the problem that Joe was trying to solve. Um, and Joe was looking to make humbuckers sound get more clarity out of a full-size humbucker and then what we've discovered and that we what we do i don't know if i have any examples of this right around me but we do a version of these pickups called the hum cutter where we remove one of the blades and three of the poles but leave the two full coils underneath the cover yeah and so we're taking an even smaller slice of the field that's being created by the string and with windings and output joe has tailored these things to sound like the best p90s you've ever heard but they're wow. completely noiseless because both coils are still there. Um, and there's different very, and so outside of that, then there's different variations with, with different magnets and different windings for different specific things. You know, um, Corgan's signature pickup is, is really loud and really mid focused and just sounds killer, you know? Um, and whereas like Bob Balch's signature pickup takes fuzz pedals really well. And Reeves, Reeves Cabral's signature pickup is really awesome. It's like our Alnico Grande uh, bridge humbucker, but with just, it's wound just a little bit hotter and it's really, really sensitive to the volume control of the guitar. Because if, if you think about how much ground that guy covers playing with the Cure, I mean, he's got to do this like jangly thing and then he has got to like, shred on like wrong number and stuff you know what i mean and he wants to be able to get all those tones out of one guitar and and he's able to get that clarity with the rail hammer pickups to 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 mimic um you know some of those old cure sounds so it they're they've just been uh, they've been doing really well it's it, really exciting and and of of all things um the pandemic like thing got a lot of people tinkering with their guitars and we sold a lot of pickups. Wow. Um, wow. Like over the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, which is, you know, you hate to point to anything that has to do with any of this and be like, well, that was kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but it is the, the rail hammer thing has been doing really well for us. And then, my, but you want to hear my guitar nerd thing about rail hammers? Go for it. I got, I have about 30 rail hammer loaded guitars from other brands in house. <laughs> Cause that's my excuse to buy and sell guitars now. Yeah. Oh, well, well we haven't done a demo video with a hammer artist yet. I should get an old hammer artist, you know? And, and, and uh, so we, and, and unfortunately I, I, I don't sell as much as I buy. I don't think, <laughs> um, but that is, that is the guitar collectors. Um, uh, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but you know what I'm talking about because I'm talking to you, uh, guitar guys. I'm still a guitar guy. I mean, I still like what other brands are putting out. I'm a huge Ibanez fan. Um, I'm a huge Paul Gilbert fan. God damn, I love Paul Gilbert. And just about everything that dude does, he totally wails. Oh, absolutely. Um, He's one of those guys, man. He just got better as he got older because he, he got what's with that? Yeah, yeah, kind of pisses me off. I didn't get any better. <laughs> but can uh, I you say know, the, best, the best thing about Paul is that he uh he writes songs, man. His yeah. records are hilarious. Yeah. And yeah. and like he's just real clever and creative stuff and like good turn of phrase stuff and like lyrics are funny. The music is just crushing. And then his records are all a journey. They're not like one thing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they're they're all there's all kinds of styles and shit. That Christmas record he put out this year is really fun. I'm gonna have to check I, that I don't out. Know, yeah, Jay, wait till next Christmas, probably, because Christmas music. <laughs> uh, but he put out a record called Twas that's that's really funny. And um, 
And in one of those things where within one song, he'll explore two or three different musical styles. And as they change, I'm listening to it in my car, like driving to a, a thing last month. And I found myself laughing out loud at some of the changes because it's just like, how did, how did you even think of that? Like, you know? Yeah. And you know, what's kind of awesome is I was in the, you know, I was in the car business for 10 years and I hated it by the time I was done. Right. I bet. And, uh, Oh yeah. And I've been in this business for 22 years and I still giggle at Paul Gilbert records. The, right? uh, use your goddamn in indicator song. Yeah. Oh yeah. Use your goddamn turn signal. Turn, yeah. sing turn yeah. signal. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I, as I'm driving <laughs> on the, on the highway, that constantly goes through my mind. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> but Ken, all the things you're describing about the Rauhammer pickups, Man, that's exactly what I'm what I'm looking for. You know, I'm one of these guys. I'm a totally a strat guy. Some of my guitars have got traditional single coil. Some have got a humbucker in the bridge. I've got one which is a got a Kinman P90 voiced single coil size, and I'm really enjoying right. that. If I got, got to take just one guitar to a gig, because it kind of is that yeah. in between for me. But what I'm yeah. loving about that pickup is it's got. Single coils to me, I'm hearing more the, the wood of the guitar. I know that's probably not technically not correct. Humbucker, I'm yeah. hearing more the amp being pushed. And that P90 sure. sound kind of gets me in between. Now, you've got me seriously yeah. wanting to try the Rauhammer because it sounds like you're getting the best of both worlds there. You should check out the, the uh, Nuevo 90s, we call them. And that is Nuevo 90. Nu uh, that is the... the so that is the P90 voiced set. Yep. And then we make we make one called the Heavy 90, which is the like hot P90. And that is my favorite pickup on the planet. Yep. And we only make it in the bridge position. And I I have that loaded in um, most of my playing out guitars. It just does it for me. I don't know. There's there's just something about there, there's just something about that bottom end. Um, and that sort of tightness that goes along with it. It's fantastic. Well, yeah, you got me thinking. Um, I don't know any local dealers of, of Reverend Guitars here. There was one. They don't have them anymore. There's a bit of a drive to, to Brisbane. I, I know there's a place, the Pedal Empire, that has quite a few of your, your guitars there. Oh, cool. And I'm uh, due to go there soon to get some bits and pieces for my pedal board. Uh, I'm going to see whether they have the Rauhammer pickups there and, and might pick up a set myself and just give it a try in one yeah. of the guitars here. Because it for sounds, sure. the way you described it, it's like, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I, You know what? I This is one of those things, too. I'd be happy to send you a set so that you could check them out and then tell everybody how great they are. I can't send to you. I literally have no option. We had to turn off Australia in our web store because our uh, our postal systems are not cooperating right now. Nothing's cooperating right now. That's oh, right. Shh, dude, you uh, you have no idea. It's a mess. I I'm I've I've about had it. But I mean, whatever. It, it is what it is. I, we're 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 all coping with it. I have I have so many things to be thankful for. Um, you know, in these times, again, our business is just the pickup business has exploded. The guitar business is doing really really well. Um, we're making the most of it. I, I'm not doing as many public appearances as I would like to. Um, before all this stuff started, I was regularly, I was traveling. I actually had travel plans to come to Australia. I told you before we came mm -hmm. on um, the thing. I, I, I've got a, a good distributor there um, that I want to come down there and spend some time with and do some videos there and, and do some stuff um, and then all this stuff happened and international travels out the window. I was regularly getting to the UK uh, before all this happened. And now that's that's out the window. We had a we had a NAM show last summer in Nashville, um, Tennessee there that that went that was OK. You know, I was glad I attended because I, I want to be part of bringing, you know, getting people back to doing things like that. Um, but it's been it's been you know, rough in that regard. It's, it's different. And I'm, I spend way too much time cooped up in here when I really want to get out and show off, you know, and really like, I like taking these things out to people. I like doing in-store stuff and answering questions in person and, and talking about this stuff. You know what I mean? Because it's, 
it, it's what I do, you know, and I miss it. I miss being out there in the world. Man, I wish I could go to Nam again. Uh, I went there a couple of years ago and it was just such a cool hang, man, with, um, with all the, the different people um, from all the different companies. Since doing this, I've gotten to know so many more people and it would just be booth to booth of, hey, man, good to, good to see you in person. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know if that's going to be happening anytime again soon. But yeah. Can I do uh, well, something, well, I mean, they're, they're having the show in June. It's the first weekend of June, and they're moving what was traditionally the January NAM show to June. And I don't know if that's permanent or not, but I got a message from them earlier today that, that the June, the first weekend of June show is going forward. But I don't know what international travel is going to look like then, so I don't know who all is going to be there or what's, what's going to be able to be done, but we will be there. Um, and that's in LA, been, LA, yeah, yep. Anaheim, Anaheim, yep, cool, cool. yes, indeed, yeah. So, but you, you mentioned before, or quite a few yeah. times, uh, Detroit. Now, Detroit, Detroit, what is it with Detroit? There is so many cool guitar things out of Detroit. Bruce Agnator, Dave Friedman, my friend Sammy Bowler lives in Detroit. Um, and I just keep hearing all this cool Both stuff coming out of Detroit. Detroit. It must just be one hell of a, a music city, huh? Yeah. Mo, uh, Motor City pickups, Red Panda pedals. Um, and yeah, of course, Naylor and us. Um, I was born and raised there. Uh, listen, the Stooges and the MC5 were from there. So if nothing else ever happened, that's enough. Uh, Iggy's, well, just the whole Stooges thing has been good for us, obviously, as a company. but. Um, but they were just legends, you know what I mean? I mean, they ushered in an energy into rock music that it hadn't seen before, where where it it just became, you know, everybody everybody always wants to point to who started, you know, uh, punk rock or whatever, and who started the 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 whole movement, you know what I mean? And the, everything just all traces back to Iggy and the Stooges. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but Motown was neat. Detroit's neat. Detroit was, Detroit is a, it's an interesting town because Detroit's high was as high, uh, an urban manufacturing environment and, and wealth as you could achieve. And then Detroit's low was as fall, as far as the city could fall to the bottom after achieving those heights. And I have been, you know, I've been all over the world. Um, but I mean, I've been all over the country anyway, and I've been to a lot of places and seen a lot of shit, and I've never seen anything that's quite like the city of Detroit. And it's very, um, it's very arrogant in its music scene at times, you know, um, and very, you know, like uninclusive and weird. And then that breeds, things like like jack white you know what i mean it like makes like things happen you know as a result of that and um it's just a strange place man and uh i love it and i take some criticism from detroiters for being in toledo so uh geographically for for you guys that are on the other side of the globe um so I, how does this work so michigan is a hand the state of michigan and um, I am, I, I don't know how I'm coming off with, yeah, no, that's, that's right. So Detroit is here in this hand and Ann Arbor, where the Stooges is from is here and Toledo is here in Northwest Ohio. And they're all about 45 minutes apart from one another. And the music scenes are relatively entwined. Um, if you're from Toledo, being in Detroit is a part of your growing up. And then Detroiters all look at Toledo like, uh, like the sort of unwanted stepchild for whatever reason. Uh, and that's fine. I grew up in Detroit and looked at Toledo the same way for years. And then I started doing gigs here and uh, fell in love with the music scene in Toledo. And um, I met some musicians down here that I still work with that mean the world to me. And um, I met my wife here. And one thing led to another and I ended up moving to Toledo. And then even when Penny and I bought the company, we kept it in the Detroit area for six years. And then we needed a bigger space 
and we just happened to find the perfect space for the build for the business in Toledo. And, um, and so we moved the company down here in 2016 from the Detroit area and Detroiters, like I said, Detroiters give me some shit about it, but that's okay. Um, they have to get used to it <laughs> because it doesn't really, it doesn't change the attitude and our, our employees came with us and Naylor still comes down here when he feels like it. And I go up and visit Joe. I play in a, you know, it's, we, I play in a band that's based in the Detroit area. I play in a band called Jay Navarro and the Traders, and uh, Jay is the lead singer for Detroit-based band called the Suicide Machines, which are just an awesome sort of ska punk uh, band that have been around since the late '90s and mid '90s. We're getting old. Well, they are. I'm not. <laughs> um, <laughs> Be a doy. And uh, I, I sort of I play guitar in Jay's side project with a bunch of Detroit musicians who are just amazing guys. And it is one of the one of the most fun things I get to do musically. Um, uh, I've been uh, I've been to Japan with these guys. I've been to the UK with them. We've been um, all over the US. And so I still play music actively. Uh, you can check out Jay Navarro and the Traders on any of the sites where you can check out music. Um, it's a lot of fun and it's sort of a ska reggae punk rock hybrid thing. Um, that's a little different and, uh, we have a lot of fun doing it. And I'm, I'm so like thankful at this point in my life that I get to like make music. I miss making music and being on the road with these guys. We did do some festivals last summer finally, which was great. Um, hopefully we get to do more in the future and, uh, and all we can start putting some of this stuff behind me. Um, we're really good friends with an Australian man called the resignators. I hope, uh, Steve is watching, um, because uh, he's they're they're a great great ska band from down under, cool. and they come to the states. They come to the states every couple of years to tour, yeah. uh, and they're really really good people. So hello, you guys, if you are watching this mess, they are reverend users, um, and uh, yeah, man, that I mean, there, that's me. That's what I do. Enough about me, Jesus. <laughs> Ken, I want to ask you something. You've got that reverse headstock right in our faces there. I know. <laughs> now, reverse headstock. This, I saw okay. you post a picture now, I, I, uh, the other day on, on social media of the reverse headstock. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. I made a comment say? of, I can't remember what you said. I remember what I said. Um, I don't own any guitars that have a reverse headstock, but the next guitar I, I get will have one because it makes so much sense. When you're tuning, let me just change the camera angle. When you're tuning and uh, you're playing a gig and you need to tune your guitar, you have to put your hand up over the top to make right. a quick adjustment. There I am. If it's on the underside, sure? let me just change oh, it. There's yep. There. It's right there. It's right next to your plank. Yep. Now just go back to a chord again, like play, play a chord and then go, oh, yeah. I didn't have the camera. Oh, yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. I always uh -huh. uh, thought they looked a little bit dicky when I was younger. It's like, why would you do that? <laughs> now I get it. It depends on what it's on. So there's, there like, <laughs> there, first off, there's no rules. Anybody can do anything that they want to. But I have my own set of rules in my head. Uh, and included in those rules is you can't put three knobs on a tele control plate or you're going to hell. Um, <laughs> it looks terrible. Don't stop. And you also can't put a reverse headstock on a tele body or you're going to hell. But that's just in my mind. I see people do it, but that's just in my mind. But here's the thing. Uh, let me get back far enough. So this, any offset waist guitar like this King Bolt body of mine, the angle of the offset body is doing this, right? He's all right. Yep. And then the headstock is on the same angle. And so it looks natural and it looks like it's whoosh. so reverse headstocks on offset waists are awesome. Uh, reverse headstocks on Ibanez RGs are awesome. Uh, I, the Ibanez headstock, I've always been kind of okay, whatever with, but you put it upside down and it's perfect. <laughs> cool. so um i'm a big so yeah I, my comment to you on that thread was no this headstock is correct all other headstocks are reversed um which is very very controversial in the industry i have uh i have taken some heat for that stance and uh, as you'll note uh while we usually have one or two reverse headstock offerings most of them are the traditional sense uh because i have to make public and dealers and artists happy 
<laughs> but if I had a signature model, it would look like this. <laughs> Ken, I'm going to have a quick look through the comment section and see if there's any questions for us there. Yeah, please while do, because I'm I, happy to answer some questions before yeah, we take off. Yeah, uh, while I do that, I'm just going to make yeah. the, the small talk comment of, are you much okay. of an audio guy and do you know what the Haas effect is? No, I do not. You've never heard of I don't know what the Haas effect is. I'm not much of an audio guy, to be honest with you. I, I, I matter of fact, I even get I get bored in the recording studio very quickly. Oh um, man, I thought I, you would have heard I that. Really it's one of those things. Like, if I if I heard, you know, the Hollis effect or something, I would just go, "Hey, that's me." Um, yeah. Basically, that's weird. What it is? If you try and make a, a studio, pseudo stereotype effect by say delaying one side um, of a stereo track by 30 milliseconds or so. Um, okay. Your ears, even though the le the level of both those tracks are the same, your ears uh -huh. will perceive the one that it's receiving first as being louder. So that's something quite often. Okay. Okay. This sounds familiar. This is ringing a bell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So quite often I'll do that when I'm mixing something to try and clear the middle, try and get rid of the guitars from the middle and make them sound wider by throwing a bit of a, a delay on one side, get a, a false double track. But every time, as soon as you do that, whatever track is the first to hit your ears sounds louder. So therefore you need to turn up the other one, which kind of sucks when you go to mono, it, it completely ruins the image. But yeah, that's called the Haas effect. Yeah. Yeah. So Two folks, ways, throw in eh? any, any comments if you have any, any questions we can. Um, I'm not sure if I say this right. Albus, Albus Band. Ken, my friend, I heard a rumor that the OG double agents are going to get Rosewood fingerboards. Is that true? Yeah, they are starting to ship with Rosewood now. So the the wood drama, the wood drama continues. Um, we had the the CITES nightmare in our industry, of course, uh, a few years back. And um, at first... We went to a product called uh, Blackwood Tech, which I really liked. And I have Blackwood Tech on one of my player guitars still, which was a pine that was basically treated, roasted, um, and looked really good. It was very, very sustainable. It felt like rosewood. It looked like rosewood. Um, it came from New Zealand, of all places. And, uh, and we liked it and had some success with it. And then... The place that made it became quickly overwhelmed by our entire industry, and we were having problems sourcing it. By the time that happened, our factory was able to get up and running. Mir was able to get up and running with Paul Farrow. Uh, I've always liked Paul Farrow. I have an early Fender Custom Shop Strat or Custom Shop Tele with a Paul Farrow fingerboard. And of course, the Stevie Ray Vaughan Strats had Paul Farrow, and I think it looks cool. Um, it's a little denser than rosewood is um but i like that grainy look and i think it, it offsets a lot of colors really nicely um because it has a lot of colors in the board and so we switched to palo Ferro and ran with it for years and even when rosewood came back we were selling guitars i i, I didn't really feel the need to change i don't there's to me there's absolutely nothing wrong with palo Ferro. i like it um and then as everybody in our industry started going back to rosewood now we can't get enough Paolo Ferro to build. <laughs> wow. And so we're going back to Rosewood. It's one of the few things that we are followers on consistently. Um, because we have to, we, you know, we, we want to offer a dark fingerboard option other than ebony. Because ebony is very, very bright, of course. Um, and a very specific thing. And people either love it or they hate it. Uh, so Rosewood um, is back. And all of the guitars from from this day forward are shipping with Rosewood boards. And there are still a lot of Paolo Ferro out in retailers right now. Um, and so we're in that sort of weird in-between period um, where you're going to have to be real specific with who you're buying from to get what you're looking for if you are a diehard Rosewood person. Um, but yes, that is your rumor is correct. It is founded, in fact. <laughs> Can you hear a difference uh, in guitar tones from um, different fretboard materials, like maple versus rosewood? I don't, but Joe does. So, and that's that's what's important. 
Um, <laughs> I play with a lot of compression, and I think the more compression that you use, you lose some subtleties. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and in in extreme cases, yes, of course. You know what I mean? If I was to sit and hold uh, the exact same East Cider that weighed similar and I had a maple board and a rosewood board next to each other, I would say that the rosewood is Joe, – Joe likes to assign percentages to things. And because I've heard him say it so many times, I tend to agree with him that like a rosewood is, is going to be like 10% warmer. I don't know what that means. I don't know what you're comparing it to exactly. <laughs> yep. um, but in the real world, the odds of having two guitars that are so similar where everything is identical, um, that you're going to be able to hear a huge difference between the two, I'm, I'm a skeptic. You know, I, and I, there's people that are going to think I'm wrong, and I am certainly not here to argue fingerboard with, with people, which is why we offer them all. Uh, rock and roll, play what you like. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Um, my my two main guitars when I when I'm touring with the traders, I have two Matt West models that I modified with um, uh, with those heavy ninety pickups that we were talking about earlier. And one has a rosewood board, and one has a maple board. And on stage, in, in with crank amps, I play I play two deluxes in that band. And uh, I run them both at about eight all the time. Cool. I have a hard time in that live scenario with running the amps that hot, discerning my maple board guitar being that much brighter than my rosewood board guitar. Well, you said and that that's played... what I that's what I think about when so, I'm doing this stuff. I I don't think about a perfect studio environment where yeah. I'm, you know what I mean? Because I very rarely put myself in that environment. So. What I'm hearing the difference between the two, and, I, and I'm, I'm a maple board kind of guy, and you said that you play with a lot of compression. I try not to play with compression. Um, yeah. I like to try and get any soak up of the transients and stuff from a, a, a tube amp, the, the sag, etc. But what I do here is it's a transient thing for me. The, the maple boards have more pop, more bloom boom, around the front of the front of the note. I could be completely crazy. No, it's just no, what I hear. I, I, I... I see what you're saying. Yeah. I, I see what you're saying. And, and um, you know, I'm a pedal board guy. And I even, I had this one pedal board rig for, I, I'm in multiple bands. I'm mul it's what people do, right? Um, and one of the projects I, uh, I had an all, um, I, I didn't know this. I had all true bypass pedals on this pedal board. I play in this. A utterly ridiculous Pink Floyd tribute polka band. Okay, I do. Cool. We play a lot of festivals. We play a lot of festivals. We have a lot of fun. I've been doing it for a long time. And I run two pedal boards in that band. And I have one that's got a bunch of different gains and 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 some chorus and some slapback on it. And then the pedal board on the other side has a stereo reverb into a Line Six DL4 that I use for the long tail delays. And I have it. I have it set up for Run Like Hell and all the shit that you got to do when you're doing Pink Floyd. And I didn't realize that everything on these pedal boards were all true bypass. And I was getting all this signal loss when I was running 25 foot cables to two amps at the back of the large stage. And I, and at one point I put a loop on one of the pedal boards to a fuzz pedal and a chorus pedal. Um, and I would turn that loop on to play the solo for time because everything else I was using overdrives for, and I wanted the fuzz pedal to really nail the time solo. And uh, um, the chorus had a buffer in it. And when I hit that loop, the volume boost that I got from my amps was like, whoa. And, and then I started hearing, I started hearing things like what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Yep. And I ended up actually buying um, a buffer from GHS to put in that delay pedal board so that I was always on because I'm always, cause that band, we don't always play big stages, but we often do. Yeah. And, and, and so I'm using those long cables and, um, and it really, I hear more of a difference in something like that. You know, something like that is like a major thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, and I, I run stereo rig in the traders too. And so I, I found that I like to have something with a buffer in it. Um, 
And so that could be why I'm losing some of that, that subtlety, sure, right? Sure, yeah, yep, yep, yep. You know? Yeah. And I, cause I'm not, I guess when I say compression, I'm not really talking about like having a compressor pedal on at all times. I really don't like compressor pedals. I like what you can do with that as a studio effect, but live, you know, um, but, but I like a lot of gain, you know, uh, I've been a big fan of the JHS, uh, angry Charlie now for a while for solos. I haven't tried that and, one. I and, need to try it. And, and, um, and I have the sweet tea as well. And I, I, which is like the angry Charlie meets their like moonshine pedal. I think these are brilliant pedals and, but they do a thing. They do a squishy thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's enough compression for me. Cool. Yeah. How it, do we it, go there? I, I, uh, maple fretboards. Let's talk about your rig. Uh, well, no. Hey, I've got to say, once you go stereo, it's very hard to go back, isn't it? Like I've it I is. run yeah, two man, Marshall 4x12s on stage when I can. And people are like, dude, you, you can't run that in here. That's too loud. It's like, it's not about being loud. Right. It's about yeah. spread. I can actually play quieter and hear myself all over the stage. So, yeah. And dude, fuck me. When I hear absolutely. hit the chorus or the delays. Oh, ah. Yep. With, um, with that, with that, with the Polka Floyd band, I run two car Elmodos and they are 88 watt. EL34 powered 212 combo amps. And they sound so awesome together, you know. And I boost the the lows on one even a little bit, you know, and, and just to sort of set it off. And then and then if you're traveling with a with a rig like that, you're never gonna be in the wind either. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've had an amp go down. I mean, tube amps go down. It happens, yeah. you yeah. know. And and I've had an amp go down since I've been running this rig for 15 years now. Um, and the show goes on. No yep. big deal. You know, yep. um, sound guys will look at you like you're crazy, by the way, as you know, you'll get like, oh, they'll be like, Mike and both. You're going to, you'll have fun with it. Really? Oh, I swear. You're going to have fun with it. Yeah. yeah. We're going to play echoes later. Yeah. If you, if you mic both of these amps and you pan them out front, you're going to have fun while I'm playing the song. Nice. Oh, nice. Okay. You know, even with with the two um, the, the stereo rig, I'll still run a redundancy rig just in case. So I do shows for um, wow, dude. a group called Absolutely Eighties, <laughs> which is a whole bunch of Australian pop and rock artists, the actual original artists, uh, the singers from yeah. all these bands, and they need it to sound just like the record. Uh, sure, and if it doesn't, course. they'll yeah. let you know. Uh, but oh, sure. yeah. for, for shows like like with those guys, I'll have my stereo rig, but I'll also I've got this little iPad running uh bias effects and if shit hits the fan i just plug into that and you would have lost me for five seconds and i'm back and yeah no one in the crowd's gonna know it, it's us guitar players as you keep saying you guys right, right, right. <laughs> you guys yeah, yeah. Uh, why am i know. like this because of you <laughs> <laughs> but yeah just it's always going to be at the most in inopportune time that shit's going to go down be prepared. I'm not even a Boy Scout, but be prepared. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I carry a spare pedal board. Like I've got this thing that I that's totally dialed in that I can do everything with. And then I it's a matter of fact, it's behind me. <laughs> and then I have this. Ah. Which is this big. Yeah. And if I travel, if we're traveling, if I have a gig overseas, this goes in my backpack. Yep. And I can do, I can do a gig in any of my bands with this board because it's awesome. all there. This, this Keely stereo reverb delay thing, this, this is a great little pedal. And, um, and yeah, so there it is and away you go, you know? And, and so going out of the country, it's really easy because it's small, but even when we, when we're in the country and I have all of my usual stuff, this is handy. Because yeah, if something something goes down, you can just yep. go. Yep. Gotta be ready. prepared. Now while you're yep. talking about gear behind you there, my friend Bernie has asked a couple of times about the roller amp behind you. Yeah. Tell us about the that, man. That is uh that is a Bob Balch signature roller amp. As you know, we make Bob's signature guitar, the guitar player from Fu Manchu. That roller is uh KT eighty eight hundred watts. 
it is so crushing <laughs> and and it is one of those two the louder you go the better it sounds yeah. it's it's just amazing um and he uh he's in the in america's pacific northwest and uh he builds them and basically in a very very small shop one at a time by hand and um he i i bob supports him uh uses this stuff i support both him and bob of course and so i wanted to have one here in my studio so that we could do uh videos with it and so that it could be here for bob when bob comes to visit which i've been trying to put together for a while now um but yeah and it's beautiful he does some really cool check out his you can check him out on social media or check out the roller website and check out some of the aesthetic because he's got a really really good eye and i love the look of that and do that you run any attenuators color. or anything with that or you just wind her up and let her rip i just wind her up and let her rip yeah i ain't scared <laughs> yeah i don't i i mean i i don't play live with it with I don't play live with a head in a cabinet anymore. I haven't done that in a really long time. I, I, listen, I'm going to pick up the laptop, so be be prepared to move. Yeah, that isn't that isn't half as scary as that. Oh, look at this! Nice. That is that is a 1978 Custom 100 with a 412, and then 215. <laughs> 215. It's the, it the most ridiculous amplifier of all time. Wow. I, it, People, people here were in tears when I brought that in. Um, and then that is, uh, that's a nailer. That is an original nailer, super drive 60 with, um, uh, with a nailer 412 cab with loaded with the nailer speakers. Yeah. And, um, get out of the way. There's that 65 twin I was talking about yep. earlier. Yep. And, uh, that is a car slant six V with, um, with six L sixes instead of um six v sixes so that's yep. a 100 watt amp as well and my car i got boy i gotta figure out how to move here um that's my car rambler that i use um on our demo videos that we shoot from here every week yep and uh i, I just love car amplifiers i think steve does incredible work and uh there's a 100 watt orange over there and then there's my uh friedman what's the uh, orange is that a rocker verb it's a rocker verb 100 yep that's we're, one of we're that doing... and a friedman have have got to be the the two amps that have got the clearest high gain sound i've ever used yeah it's it's and the the friedman in particular i mean really out marshall's marshall yeah that is that is the uh, wildwood guitar small box 50 friedman so they wildwood offers a, a mod with that's got like a third channel with a little boost it's ridiculous yep, yep. and uh, i was playing through it with Greg a lot at Wildwood. And I, I, I just wanted to have one for here. And then the orange to, um, for doing high gain video, uh, with the, um, with the rail hammer pickups, so many guys play orange stuff that having orange stuff in some of the demo videos makes it really relatable. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. Um, that thing weighs a ton, man. I, I I've, I've taken it out to, I've taken it out to a couple shows and it's like, uh, um, but th there's been shows where, um, because the clean, the clean sound on it is, is pretty transparent, you know, um, shows where I know that there's going to be a back line of cabinets that I just have to bring ahead. I'll, I'll bring that head yeah. and, and, and it'll be just fine. I got a little 50 watt EVH over here too. Oh, yep. Yep. That, um, that we shoot demo videos with. And yeah. again, the, the demo I, you know what? Is this in the budget? Because I, I gotta have it for the videos. <laughs> <laughs> now you're saying about the weight on that on that rocker verb. I was working at a music store a few years ago now, and they did a bit of backline hire to a big festival, and I had to check that all the gear that came back was in working order. I went up upstairs to the warehouse, and um, they were the orange importer and dealer at the time. And there was a Rocker Verb 100 head and I went to move it and I thought someone was playing prank on me and that they'd, they'd nailed it down or something. <laughs> so I quite literally did the whole. It, yeah, it, it is. What? It is really something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is It is brutal. Absolutely. No and, but I'm a, I'm a small box, Friedman small box guy. Um, yeah. I sold mine a few years ago to fund an overseas trip, funnily enough, to go and hang out with Dave Friedman in Germany. And 
Um, I've been pining for one since. Um, Dave is going to send me one eventually with a, a couple of customizations on it, and I'm very Woo-hoo. much looking forward to that. I'm, I'm aware of the, the nice. Wildwood version. Um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that's that's my choice of amp, and I, I'm missing an arm without it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I was, I was a real high gain amp guy for a long time. I used to play for many years. I played a Marshall sixty one hundred five. Um, had you know the thirtieth anniversary three channel? Yeah, the purple one. They did in the 90- yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah, they, it was like sort of a deep blue purple. Yeah, yeah they did I'm the colorblind blue purple combo, to me. which was really weird. And then they did a head version of that, and and. I liked that amp when it came out in 92, I got one basically to, cause the second ch- I was playing in, in a band at the time where I literally needed really clean and ultra high gain. And then I needed to be louder to play leads. And nowadays that, that, that is an option that you can get in a lot of stuff. And back then that was, it was hard to come up with because I, I did not want to play pedals. I wanted to plug straight in and that's what I needed. I needed, I needed to be able to boost solos. So clean, high gain and louder was yeah. what I wanted out of an amp. And that Marshall did that really pretty well. Um, and I, I kept one of those hanging around for a really long time. And that's the one I sort of look back on and be like, I, I could still have a use for that. But now I've gotten so used to doing the toe dance that um you know you slap an eq pedal after your your overdrive and you're good to go for the leads or whatever and so that's fine um, so the whole toe dance me. thing and and needing the multiple sounds and everything i'm just okay. going to grab something from right over there okay yeah i keep doing it yeah why not yeah why not I'm, I'm hey so listen you. while he's gone let me tell you about this guy oh shit he's coming back i'll tell you later Oh, no way. The ADA. I had one of those. <laughs> I had one of those until not too long ago. Wow. That's, that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. That'll do no, it. I, that was, that you, was my. You have the controller that's this long too. The guy I got this from, um, yeah. I went to list this uh, on Facebook marketplace the other night. And as soon as I did, I regretted it. And the guy that, that I got this from messaged me and said, dude, I've got the controller. Do you want the controller as well? I'm like, um, yeah, as a package, they're yeah. fetching quite a pretty penny these days. Um, um, I wish I still had mine. The only thing, man, I used to use this for everything. The only thing that I don't like about it is trying to make adjustments on the fly because there's no oh, yeah. fucking knobs. And No, no, that, very true. But, you know, um, I'm going to bring up a weird band. Do you remember, do, are you familiar at all with uh, a band from – Switzerland called Coroner. No. And they were around in the late eighties and early nineties pummeling metal band, but like super riff based. And the, the Tom, they, he called himself Tommy T Baron, but I don't think that's his real name. Um, I, and I can't remember what his real name is off the top of my head, but the lead guitar player for this band was, was just a riffing god and his solos were just unbelievable and and they didn't sit still on uh, like moving power chords around to play metal it was just constant riffing and amazing stuff and and bass player too and the two of them just on it together at all times and um i saw them touring for their their second record in detroit in 1989 and those were new and he played through one of those the whole set had the foot controller in front of him, never touched it the entire time. <laughs> and I remember he sounded amazing, you know what I mean? And I just remember thinking, man, what a pain in the ass all that stuff is to not even, to just have like one really good tone. And I mean, he used it to get one really good tone, but but then he had this foot controller in front of him on the stage. That was this. <laughs> I, I, I must say, those, those controllers, the buttons on them were terrible. Like they just did oh. not last at all. Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. No, no. Um, no. What a that's a funny blast from the past, man. Yeah, I definitely had one of those things. MP1, uh, everybody right? did. That was the dream. You yeah. know, I, I would see those. I was, you know, teenager, and I'd see them in the, the magazines and just think, I need one of those. 
I need one of those. And yeah, that was my first decent amplifier was one of them. <laughs> In stereo, that's, that's what started the stereo thing. That I had a, a yeah. Carver solid state power amp, two Marshall valve state quad boxes, quad boxes, four by 12s. It's only Australians that say oh, quad yeah. box. Um, I like that. Have you heard the term quad box before? Only from Australians. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that until I was talking to Thomas Blug. Do you know Thomas from uh, that makes the Amp One floor amplifier? I do. No, I do not. No, cool, he's, he's a German guy that makes this really cool okay. pedal board amplifier called the, the Blue Guitar Amp One. Anyway, I had him on the show, and he's saying to me, "Oh, there's this is there's this word that you guys say uh, that nobody else says." Uh, to describe uh, a four by twelve cabinet, I went what like a quad box. And he went, yeah, quad box, quad box. And I had no idea that that's purely an Australian thing. <laughs> yeah. My uh, Australian distributor used that term with me, and I had to ask him what he meant. Who is the Australian distributor? Um, um, don't put me on the spot like uh, that. Better, music better and music? audio. Is it better music? Music and audio. Music and They're audio. They're called music and audio. A couple of guys used to work for Better Music. I think they went and started a distribution company. So music and audio arts, they're called. And I don't know who they sell to, but some of the dealers that they sell to are listed on our website for sure. I'm going to get in touch with them and see if I can try out some of your gear. Um, some they're really nice people. Some, some distributors are very YouTuber friendly. Some just don't want to know about it. I'll get in touch with those guys. And... You know, my, our biggest problem with them is we can't, get them what they want from us. I mean, that's, you know, the, and the, of course we're going through that now, we're, but we're, we're suffering some, some growing pains. I mean, like I said, things are going really well here. I could, I've, I've spent a lot of time sort of trying to grow this business. And one of the things that, that, that we talked about earlier in our conversation is, is we're, we're coming into our 25th year and I've seen a lot of companies come and go in the 25 years that I've been doing this. And one of the things that, that I see people do is, is somebody, somebody will have a really good idea and they'll throw it out there and they'll get, they'll get some dealer orders for their cool thing, their cool idea, their cool guitar, their cool pedal, their cool amp, their cool, whatever it is in the music business. And so they have a good idea. They get a good player maybe interested in it. And because they have a good player who's interested in it, they get a dealer who's interested in it. And then that dealer gives them a decent sized order. They want 20 or 30 of them. So the guy sort of ramps up to make 20 or 30 of them. And this one dealer has it. And word starts to get out a little bit. And this one dealer starts doing really well with it, right? So then he's like, well, we got to take this thing nationwide. We got to take this thing global. So then he gets some investment on the promise of everything that's happened now up to this point, right? You're following me in this story. And <laughs> all of a sudden, he's got a lot of them to sell. And he's got this one artist that uses it. And he made some money off of where he's gotten this far. So he puts a couple ads in, in a couple of magazines. And then 20 dealers want it. And he sells to those 20 dealers and then he has some money to advertise even bigger. So then he sells it to 150 dealers and then he opens up a distributor here and he opens up blah, 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 blah. And he has built himself a, a business on dealer orders and cash coming in from dealers that looks really good on paper. And you're getting a lot of guitars out there, or getting a lot of pedals out there or whatever you're doing. But then he hasn't built up enough public awareness of the product that now you have a lot of stuff and a lot of dealers all over the country, all over the world that isn't selling. And then it starts to fall back in on itself because you just went too quickly or whatever. Yep. And for, for accidental reasons or because you, but we never, so Reverend, one of the reasons why we're coming up on 25 years is because we somehow, I think we avoided that. Um, and it's been this like slow and steady growth where artist and public awareness has grown with us to get us to sort of where we are. And then we had all of this stuff happen in the last couple of years. And 
I'm really feeling the pull. And, um, you know, we're making stuff as fast as we can, but I can't get any more product in the pipeline because of parts suppliers and because of, because of, of logistics and all of the different things that are, that are affecting all of our lives right now are, are really affecting us. And, you know, I wonder, cause I feel like right now I could be selling four or five times as many guitars as I'm making, but if I was doing that, would I be falling into this thing that I've been trying to avoid or this mistake that I, I see other people make or whatever. And I, I don't want to do that. And so like I said, you get me on one of your shows, dude. I'll blather on about the this side of this business and how, and the challenges of it or whatever, you know. And right now, our biggest challenge is getting products to people like music and arts in in um, or music and audio in Australia. I would love to give them what they want from us, and it pains me, you know, when I have a conversation with these guys and they're like, "We really need more. We could we could be." They tell me they could sell four or five times as many guitars as I'm giving them. And I, nothing in the world would please me more than be able to supply them with that. Yeah. But I can't make it happen. You know what I mean? As much as I want to, but we're trying and we're working on it. Um, and so if you're, you know, if you're on the waiting list for something from me, I apologize for the wait time um, for it. And I just, we, you know, uh, we, we care and we're doing our best. The other thing that cracks me up about this, the other big misnomer about this business, I don't know why I'm going down this road, but you started it, um, is, uh, is, <laughs> I love it. I love it when people say uh, that somebody is getting rich doing this. That is, that just, that is the funniest thing ever. I, I, everybody, and I know in this business that has, uh, is successful, you know, uh business in this industry nobody's getting rich nobody's driving around in porsches nobody's got big houses and mansions and factories and cars and you know uh except for maybe smith uh, maybe he's got a, a helicopter with walnut leather trim or something <laughs> i don't know but i don't i just look around me and see a bunch of in, no matter what it is whether it's guitars or amps or pedals or whatever. I just see a bunch of people working hard and making a living. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, and some of the stuff that I read from with the, some of the criticisms and stuff that I read from people online, you know, and you don't read it, man, because people are brutal. Um, but we really are truly, we're just trying our hardest, you know, I got kids, man. <laughs> I'm just, living. just trying to make a living. Got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Ken, I actually have a I have a question for one of our viewers that I know is watching, um, Paulie. Sure. And Paulie messaged Hi, me Paulie. the other day uh, to say that he owns six Reverend guitars. I think he said. So I'm interested to know, Paulie, if you can drop in the comments, man, what models do you own? I'd, I'd like to pass that on to Ken while we've got him here. Uh, and while you, it might be a bit of a delay to get to him for that, but I'm going to see. There was a couple more questions. Uh, yeah. Ken, can you make a Rick Hollis Reverend? That'd be cool. <laughs> that wasn't Hi, for Rick. me. <laughs> um, now, what Reverend guitar from Lonesome Lenny, what Reverend guitar has a jazz vibe? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, we used to, uh, well, we did a humbucker version of our Pete Anderson hollow body for a little while that really sounded amazing in the neck pickup. Um, we're not really currently offering anything with a traditional jazz guitar vibe, um, for something like that, you, you, you really should be looking at heritage or somebody who does that thing. You know, um, I will say this, the rail hammer pickup is probably the best pickup for jazz electric guitar on the market today. Um, but it's so weird looking that jazz guys go, oh, I couldn't put that on my guitar. And it's really too bad because when they do and they hear it, they're, they're, they can't believe. So the, the blades under the wound strings in the neck position, there's never any muddiness or fartiness or anything going on in that. And it's got this just rich, full bass sound because where it sits under the strings and so our hyper vintage humbucker 
in the neck position of a big jazz box sounds incredible. Wow. It's just such a great tone. Um, and I totally love it. And so while I can't necessarily recommend a Reverend guitar for you, um, if you have a humbucker jazz box, you should really check out the rail hammer hyper vintage pickup in the neck. You'll, you'll be thrilled. Awesome. Awesome. Now I just found, uh, Paulie has posted, he actually posted it just before I asked the question as well, but I oh, that's funny. have been giving you my attention, Ken, not the chat room because there are times where sometimes I'll be reading that. And then I realize, Holy crap. I'm not, I haven't listened to what this guy's talking about, uh, 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 uh. but, uh, Paulie has descent times two. Six, nice. Uh, six gun sensei, uh, a 2016 limited edition. Oh yeah. Nice. Roundhouse times two and Dude. a King bolt awaiting my next trip to Arizona. If that ever happens. Oh, nice. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you. So in, so he could tell you about the rail hammer pickups too, because he's got them in a handful of those guitars there. That's awesome. Mm, mm. Um, I just you, want to say, man, before we go, Paulie is a talented motherfucker, man. He plays guitar, but yeah, oh, that's great. he actually fronts a, uh, a, a Guns N' Roses tribute band. Um, he's one of those guys that plays around town in cover bands, original bands. Mofo was dead is the name of his original act and could just sing anything. Super nice guy. Props to Polly. Thanks for watching, dude. Well, yeah, man, thanks, Polly. Man, thanks for being a fan. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Have you told Rick about the descents and how awesome they are? You know about the descents? I, I don't see him enough, mate. I, I live on the Gold Coast, which is about an hour's drive away from Brisbane, where Paul's based. Um, okay. And it's once every year or two that I do cross paths with him. But next time I see him, I'm going to say, give me a play of that fucking guitar, man. Yeah, yeah. You should check out the descent. We do a baritone um, that... We make an interesting baritone, and uh, I, I, two of, two of the more popular Reverend models that are always in our top five are the Descent Baritone and the Airwave Twelve String, and the reason for that is is um, Naylor designed both of those guitars from the ground up to be what they are. So, like when he went to make the Airwave, um, he didn't just slap a twelve string neck on something that we're already making. He he sat down. And, and we actually worked with Chris Funk from the band, the Decemberists quite a bit on that airwave model. Um, and he road tested a lot of that stuff for us, which was awesome. But he, um, he sat down and, and thought about what the limitations were to an electric 12 string other than tuning issues. And because he already had ideas for how he could solve that. And then he set out to solve all of those problems. So the the instrument is much more than just, well, we we just have twelve tuners on a jet stream and away we go. It's 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 well thought out. Um, matter of fact, I have one behind me right over there, and yeah. it is a twenty four and three quarter sail Carina chambered, semi hollow Carina body with a solid spruce top, and the spruce top gives it this sort of acoustic zing that really helps with the clarity on the twelve. And then there are 12 locking tuners on the headstock, uh, but the body is very lightweight, which is why the upper horn projects out so far so that it balances well on a strap, even though it's light, because with the 12 tuners, it could get heavy, right? Mm -hmm. yep. um, and it is, it's just an awesome sounding instrument. And then the Descent Baritone um, is a similar thing. It's based on uh, our King Bolt body, except we moved, we did a hybrid scale length it's 26 and three quarter and we ship them tuned to b and the bridge is moved back on the body a little bit so that you don't feel like you're reaching to the sky to to play in your number one position yeah. on the the baritone guitar and then we ship it with a custom set of strings that joe came up with that has a plain 26th in the third string position so instead of having a wound third it's got a plain third yeah so a guy who plays guitar when they pick this up it feels like a guitar only it's tuned to be yeah um it's a really really interesting really good sounding guitar and so it's kind of funny because it's two kind of quirky instruments um but i i i like to to tell my dealers with both of those guitars you have your diehard guys that you know you're that the you're diehard strat guys, you know, that that's what they play and that's all they're going to play or whatever. And they need a 12 string for something and, and, or whatever, 
this is, we have something for them. You know what I mean? That, and, I, and I know that that's never going to be, you know, this, it's, it is some people's main guitar. There are people that have 12 strings as their main guitar and bless them. <laughs> um, not me. I'm, I don't know what it is. I fall apart on the 12 string. It's tuned the same. You'd think it would be easy. Um, but, uh, it, but people who are in the need of a 12 string or a baritone, you know, we have like the best of the, of those worlds available to people, you know, for it, totally pro level, ready to go guitars, um, for, you know, whatever, 1200 bucks in the U S. And so we sell a lot of baritones, a lot of 12 strings. And it's awesome that your man has two of them there. Um, I'm wondering if he has a trem and a hardtail, uh, because we do that baritone with a Wilkinson trem it's tuned to be crushes. Cool. cool. Totally just awesome sound. Yeah. Well, he's told me anyway. in the comments there that he's going to bring him down around for a jam. I'm going to take you up on that, Paulie. That'd be awesome, man. Yeah. Um, awesome. Cool. No guitars with Floyd Roses. No, it's not our shtick. I, I like guitars with Floyd Roses, so I'm certainly not going to sit here and be like, uh, uh, no. As a matter of fact, I uh, we were talking about him earlier. I, I, have, I have six PGMs and uh, seven or eight gems. Um, that I've collected over the years. I, a lot of them I got when prices were sort of down, yep. uh, which I'm really glad I did because I got like an original purple swirl and original green swirl gem and nice. I, all the floral patterns and stuff. I, my first real my first real guitar outside of the telly, of course, that I inherited. But the telly wasn't, I wasn't, I couldn't play Dag Nasty and, and Black Flag with the telly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I saw this great American band called Big Drill Car. One of my first gigs was opening for this band, Big Drill Car, and their their guitar player was playing a white RG uh, five fifty. And I, I just in nineteen eighty nine, man, I, I was that was it. You know, I had to have one. And so my first guitar that I that I bought new for myself um, was a Ibanez RG five seventy, and I still have it. And I know how Floyd's work. People, I love, I love guys with floating trims, and they're like, "Well, you can't do double stop bends." Well, you can. You just have to bend both strings. Yeah. And when, and once you get used to doing that, when I play a hardtail guitar, I have to think about not bending both strings. You know. Yeah. Um, the Wilkinson trims that Naylor uses, we set them up properly, and I really like the Wilkinson VS50 trim, um, not unlike a Floyd it while while you don't have to lock the strings in place you can swap the strings just like you do on a vintage trim or whatever um when you set up that vs50 you have an allen wrench thing that you have to do there's no springs in the saddles and so when you set the intonation and you set your string height and then you lock it down and then it becomes one mass and so you get that punch that initial string attack that you get from floyd guitars because you're connected to the block because everything is welded together, right? Um, and then the other neat thing about that is nothing ever moves. Saddles don't slide around or move around on you. If you play the same strings every time, you, once you dial in that um, that that Wilkinson trem for the s strings that you play, it's dialed in forever, and you can just let the whole thing fuse together from your ugly man and lady sweat. Um, <laughs> like my iPod, I've got one to show you. You'll like this. Cool. Never too far away from me. This is my East Sider S, and you can see that Wilkinson trem is nasty. Yeah, yeah. I've been I've been gigging live with this one for uh, in that Pulp of Floyd band for years. Yeah. I we recess the body on a lot of our Wilkinson trem guitars, like yep. uh, the Reeves model, mm -hmm. so that when I pull up, it I get I get two steps on the G string. Yep. Like you do with Floyd. Yep. Um, and with the locking tuners and the nut done properly, I mean, yep. because it's floating, it can do all the, the uh, you know, the flutters and all that shit. And that's how we set up the Reeves guitars. Um, I I haven't had, I haven't really, I don't, I haven't seen the need. I'm not, and one of the things that I, I'm very, very hesitant to say is never here, you know, uh, because I I said we'd never do a Strat style guitar, and we're doing that uh, Gil Paris with the Fishman pickup. I now. saw that. I saw that, and and, uh, and it's a really cool guitar, and it just happened, 
it happened to fill a need for an artist we have if if we weren't doing the fishman thing with greg i don't think that ever would have gotten that far um gill expressed interest in using the fishman pickups after um doing uh we did a clinic with gill and greg in new york city and and he liked he wanted to try them in in his signature model and then we started screwing around with it and then Naylor said well if we're going to use these pickups we should just put it in an s body and be done with it gill likes s bodies anyway and then all of a sudden we're making a Karina s body guitar and it's cool it fills a need people are buying it i yeah. i took some heat for it of course i took some heat for it you know because we do our, our stuff is pretty unique you know yep. and to all of a sudden come around and be like well we're we're making this um but so what it's cool it's fun and well, uh and people seem to like it so the one thing that people don't bring up about floyd roses is and um, why i want to get myself that ultimate strat with the floyd rose and i'm just gonna say gil was actually watching before i'm not sure if he's still here but he's dropped a couple of comments <laughs> earlier on um awesome yeah. Now, when I was checking out the website, it was the the Gil Paris that caught my eye because I'm a, a strat guy. You're, yeah, sure. Now, happens. Floyd Rose, if you break a string, well, a, apart from the downside that if it's floating, it's going to go, guitar's going to go out of tune, which happens with any floating wow. system. If you break a string, sure. you can put the bloody thing back on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's true. my big thing yeah. is I'm a broke musician. I spend all my money on music here. So strings isn't something yeah. that just comes out my ass, you know. Well, if I remember I break, back in. Yeah. It's always an A or a D string for me that goes first, and when that goes, um, if I've pr provided, I've got enough. Loosen it up and pull yep. the string. Down bang, bang, stick it back in. Done. Oh, I've done it. I've done it plenty of times. I always man. do I know it. Exactly what you're talking about. Especially yeah, if I'm using sure. a, a coded string. So I got a. You mentioned Hamer guitars. So I got a Hamer uh, Chaparral sitting right there with a. It's a 89 or 90 model there. Um, Boomerangs. You want to see? Boomerangs or dots, my man. We're going to talk about hammers. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm going to go get mine. We'll see who's bigger. All right. All right. I will do a. All right. What you got? Dun, dun, dun. What you got? Dun, dun, dun. Dun, oh! Dun, 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 dun. I'm so jealous. Oh, you got the Sustaniac in there too. Yeah. I just replaced that recently. If you look online, you will see my demo of oh, the new Sustaniac. Dude. This, The original um, Sustaniac in this Hello. just chew through batteries like you would not believe. Uh, so I pulled that out, shit, in the early 90s or something. I got this in 91. Um, oh, and... Um, yeah, I gutted the original Sustainiac because it just used way too much juice, uh, batteries. I put this in recently. Man, this has a Floyd Rose, but the low end on this guitar, i have it's my, my chunkiest sounding guitar by far. Awesome. Yeah, Very but cool. I've got um, coated Elixir strings on it, and I think I've probably had the same strings on this for at least two years because if I break a string, wow, I'll just dude. put it back Me. on. Yeah, I'm not one of those yeah. acidic sweat guys, um, and... Okay. Yeah, I get a long time. That's still got a lot of snap about it. They got to be two years old. I, I I am one of those acidic sweat guys, and I pretty much, for especially for that Polka Floyd band, I pretty much change strings for every show. Some of those shows are long though. Um, with the other band, I can go a couple few days, but I will pop. Uh, I'll usually pop the B string, and um, yeah. Yeah, no, I hear you. What you're saying. So, hey, well, anyways, while we're at it, yep. Look at this. Woo! Nice. Yeah, this is a artist. Oh, artist custom, I guess. Yeah, but you mentioned earlier what beautiful, that was. Beautiful top. Th those are those Railhammer Nuevo '90s I was telling you about oh. with the one blade and the. You see how that? See how that's done? Yeah. And then I, I love this guitar though, with the fancy inlays and the binding on the headstock. And what year is this from? Oh, this is. I think this is from the early two thousands. Yeah. So this was, this was near near the end of when, uh, you know, before they sold, or what, or folded, or however all of that worked for yeah. them, unfortunately, but. Beautiful guitars. They really make nice stuff. I've always wanted a Californian. Yeah. And the prices of that stuff have gotten completely just absolutely 
it's incredible. I, so whatever, maybe someday I always keep my eye open. You know what I mean? You never know. Yeah. Um, and I, I like to go to guitar shows. I still really like to go to guitar shows and like hunt for guitars and stuff. And I, I just, I have too many guitars basically is where it comes down. Never. But, um, but a, a Hamer Californian with boomerangs and a reverse headstock, call me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, Ken, it's been absolutely awesome having you on, man. It has been, uh, man. Yeah, yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed this. This was a good time. Yeah, as yeah. I told you. Yeah, just in person if I ever get down there. Well, it, likewise, uh, likewise, if I make it to, to NAM again, I'll definitely be come, dropping yeah. by the booth and saying good day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Do you do you walk around the NAM show with the camera for your show and, and interview people and do stuff? Uh, I didn't last time. Um, You're the next... only person that doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, because that, <laughs> that's that's become that's become the thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, my plan of attack for next time would be to spend a day not doing that, just going to see my friends at booths, yeah. and then maybe line it up if they're okay. Hey, should I drop by tomorrow with the camera? Um, yeah, because nobody wants a camera in their face the whole time. You know, <laughs> you just want to be real. I- that is literally why I go <laughs> <laughs> for a bit but of airtime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Cause that's yeah. so Penny. Penny says this guy wants to shoot a video. Go. That's <laughs> okay, hon. All right, here I go. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it's it's fun. I like. I it's fun. You know, the Nam show used to be such a, a a focal point to release new product and talk about new product, and and now it is really. I mean because of the way people order things now um just in general small dealers big dealers everybody you know um people are placing orders so far in advance and wanting to know what what we're doing here and there if we go to an am show we're not we're not taking orders for things or selling things anymore you know what i mean not like we used to i mean maybe you know here and there um, but we are really i am going to talk to guys like you and um and to you know shake hands with people and and i'm going to see my friends and all my other manufacturer friends and all that stuff too i mean that's a big part of our business and what we do and that's a lot of penny and i's friend group uh for crying out loud anymore but um it's you know i wouldn't be i wouldn't be embarrassed about doing that people people are expecting it and they're wanting it because quite frankly um me having a direct conduit to talk to people who are interested about what i'm doing through somebody like you through what you're doing um it's it's a lot different than me just sitting in this chair on my youtube channel talking about my product you know what i mean yeah um there's there's something that's organic about sitting down and having a conversation with somebody so um i will wrap this up by saying thank you for having me on thank you and if you ever if you ever want to follow up with me down the road you know what i mean if you want to do this every once in a while if you're yep. like oh i wish i would have asked him that asked him this you know write it down and i'm happy to talk to you again uh, at some point down the road and by all means uh when you get to the states uh, make sure and have the reverend booth be part of your thing and to everybody who watches you in australia i swear there's guitars coming and for everybody else who tuned in thanks for tuning in and watching us awesome. everybody have a fantastic day and night Thanks, Ken. I'm going to hit the button with my magic end screen, and it goes something like this. <laughs>